Good evening and welcome to the June 14th, 2018 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair of the committee, and I'll begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Molly Burnham? Present. Ms. Rebecca Zansky? Present. Ms. Laura Present. Ms. Ann Hennessy? Present. Mr. Lonnie Kaufman? Present. Mr. Downey Meyer? Present. Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Ms. Susan Ball? Present. Mr. Edward Present. And Mayor David Present. Excellent. So, um, this uh, because it is our f uh, final meeting uh, of, of June, uh, we will uh, actually have a special retiree recognition ceremony, and the superintendent and I will now move over to the podium for that. Welcome retirees and friends. It's uh, very good to have you with us here tonight. I'd like to take just a few minutes to talk to you about Ithaca's. Um, Ithaca is an image that comes from a poem that here in Northampton we teach in the middle school, um, but you can spend your whole life trying to figure out. Um, and Ithaca is home, right? Ithaca is the place where you're as happy as you can possibly be where everything is just the way you want it to be, um, where you're doing exactly what you want to do. And so um, I think it's very important to always know your Ithaca, but at this point um, in your journey, I think it's really important to know your Ithaca. So I'd like you just to call that up in, the, in your mind's eye, think about what that place is like while I recite a few lines from Ithaca. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you're destined for. But do not rush the journey. Better that it lasts for years so that you are old when you get to that island, wealthy with everything you've gained upon the way. Ithaca will not make you rich, kind of like teaching. Uh, <coughs> but Ithaca gives you the journey. Ithaca gives you each a journey. Without her, you would not set out. So um, in three and a half more school days, um, as far as I'm concerned, your only job is to find that Ithaca. And so we want to make sure that you're well prepared for the journey. So we have a gift for those of you who are present. And we'll also acknowledge those who are not present. We do this just like the wedding dance um, in order of an order of service. <laughs> <laughs> so first, we have Mary Beth Radke retiring at JFK Middle School after five years with the district. Not here tonight. Candy Tauscher, an administrative assistant at JFK Middle School, retiring after seven years with the district. Greg Kerstetter, tiered support specialist at Ryan Road Elementary, retiring after nine years with the district. Cheryl. Jaffe, an art teacher at Northampton High School, retiring after 10 years with the district. Kim Broussard, an administrative assistant at Northampton High School, re retiring after 17 years with the district. Patrick Fennessy, custodian at Bridge Street Elementary, retiring after 17 years with the district. Now, someone who's here. James Corman, technology teacher at JFK Middle School, retiring after 17 years with the district. Scott Smith, an ESP at Northampton High School, retiring after 17 years with the district. Mary Bates, first grade teacher at Jackson Street Elementary School, retiring with 18 years with the district. Barbara Black, director of early childhood, retiring after 20 years with the district. So, 
Bonnie Palmer, a first grade teacher at Leeds Elementary School, retiring after 20 years with the district. Bill Owen, a guidance counselor at Ryan Road Elementary School, retiring after 21 years with the district. Alba Colon, an ESP at Jackson Street School, retiring after 22 years with the district. And then we come to Kathy LaJoy, a kindergarten teacher at Leeds Elementary School, retiring after 22 years with the district. And at her second retirement gathering of the night, we have Sharon Carlson, <laughs> PE teacher at JFK Middle School, retiring after 27 years with the district. <laughs> Lizanne Giordano, guidance counselor at Northampton High School, retiring after 28 years with the district. Stephen Hanks, music teacher at JFK Middle School, retiring after 28 years with the district. And then we have Michelle Subaz, a fifth grade teacher at Leeds Elementary School, retiring after 30 years with the district. And Chester Browski, custodian at Northampton High School, retiring after 32 years with the district. Best wishes, everybody. So we will now move into the uh, next portion of the agenda, um, which is the public comment per period. Um, we have one person signed up tonight, our <coughs> former colleague, Pam Hanna. Uh, if you could just state your name and address for the record. Sure. Uh, Pam Hanna, 11 Church Street, Northampton. I'm a former Ward 1 um, school committee member. You got my timer? Yes. Uh, so I am uh, here today to speak about the lockdown that happened last week, and I want to say uh, really three things, four. Uh, so first, I want to uh, thank the first responders, uh, the police, uh, the teachers, the administrators, um, for what I know that they did to protect the young people um, in our district. And, um, you know, the teachers and administrators, I know you didn't uh, come to the schools to be security officers, you came to love children, teach children, um, and be integral in their uh, upbringing. Oh, so thank you for that. Uh, the second thing, I was really struck when I read in the Gazette, uh, I'll just read a couple of lines that really struck me. Um, and this is about Matthew uh, Bursky, Bursk, whatever his last name is. Uh, you know, he had some time, uh, and so he didn't really think much about uh, pulling out weapons. Uh, he said, oh yeah, I noticed some people uh, on the basketball and tennis courts, but I didn't think much about it. Um, he just he simply wasn't thinking about what he was doing when he removed the pellet gun from his car. I call white privilege. That only comes, that not thinking, to sit in a, a schoolyard and to think that, that's only white privilege. And uh, there was a picture that I saw, um, and then also he was observed sitting on the curb in handcuffs. Um, I also call white privilege there, and I sadly feel certain that if it was a brown person, who was in the parking lot and pulled out a weapon that the police would have sadly, I, I think, I feel certain that he would have been treated much differently and he would not have just been sitting on a curb. He would have been pushed to the ground. And I, I'm sad to say that, but I feel like uh, as a white person, we can't just call out um, acts of violence against people of color. We have to call out when we see white privilege happening. And it's harder to do that but, but we have to do that. And so I feel just compelled to, to name that. And I encourage the white people uh, in this room, of, of which I see many, many, um, that, that we have to do that. We have to call out those, those acts. Um, and the other thing, the last thing that I want to say is I see a, an opportunity here 
for restorative justice, for, for Matthew to really, um, to, really, to really make good about what he did. And I see that by him sitting and listening to the students of JFK, of, of all the schools, and, and hearing what their experience was. Because certainly, the students are used to lockdown drills, right? It's sad, this is a part of their reality. They know it, they get it. But when a lockdown drill lasts for longer than 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, all of a sudden, it's terror. The students in our district, in the high school, in JFK, in Ryan Road, in Leeds, Bridge Street, Jackson Street, our children were terrorized last Friday because they did not know what was happening. And I call on, <clears throat> call on him to come and sit and listen to what the experience was of the teachers, of the administrators, and the students. And he can listen and take in, and he can offer them an apology. And by, them, by him listening, he can offer some healing to the students in our district. And I call on you to make that happen. And, and that's, the, that's his repayment. That's, that's him paying his debt to, to our community for what he did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment this evening? Okay. Hearing none, then we'll move on to um, announcements from the school committee. Are there any announcements? Okay, no announcements. Okay, so now we'll move into recommended actions of the school committee. Um, we have a consent agenda this evening that consists of the approval of minutes of the sur curriculum subcommittee of May 10th, 2018, the rules and policy subcommittee of May 23rd, 2018, and the curriculum subcommittee of May 31st, 2018. We also have some budget transfer approvals, a uh, transfer to the fund the end of year technology purchases, as well as a transfer to align our payroll account to correct a DESI code. Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? I, uh, I have you, a discussion. Okay. Did you wish to take something off of the consent yes. agenda? Thank okay. You. I would um, ask to take the two curricular subcommittee meeting notes off the consent agenda, and I guess we return to them momentarily then? Yes, we do. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, so then uh, those two items will be taken off of the uh, consent agenda motion. So um, do you second the motion with those removed? Do you second the motion with those two sure. removed? Okay. Yes, so, um, so the consent agenda has been um, moved and seconded minus those two items. All those in favor, please say. Um, didn't have an opportunity to also um, lend my. Sure. So there are, are there items within the curriculum minutes that I would like? We're going to come back to them. Yeah. Do I have to state those as well? Um, those, the two curriculum subcommittee minutes have been taken off the consent agenda, which means as soon as we vote on the consent agenda, then we'll be taking up immediately the, the minutes, and then they, those can be discussed. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All those in favor of the consent agenda as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So now we have... Um, off the consent agenda, we have the curriculum subcommittee minute meetings of May 10th, 2018. Um, and I will, uh, I guess, it will, eventually we'll need to accept them, but if, can we have a motion to accept them and then we can have debate about them or comments about them? Sure. Okay. So a motion to accept them. Accept those minutes. Is there a second? Second. Okay, great. And then I assume you would like to discuss that. Yeah, I'd just that. like to make a comment. Sure. Um, my comment is in um, reading through both sets of them, I have several um, <coughs> not necessarily minor edits, and I would like to ask the committee if I could do that via email with the clerk um, and have them resent. I think there's a few inaccuracies in some of the things attributed to what I said, and I'd like to clarify those, and then could they come back to the next meeting after we've had a chance to go through that process? Okay, so then it sounds um, okay. It sounds more like you'd like you may want to instead then um, postpone consideration of these items. Sure. I, I think that makes more sense than going line by line. Yeah, that would definitely make asking more for sense. changes yeah. in front of the committee. Yep. Yeah. Um, and is that? Do you have a similar concern about the May thirty first? I do. Okay. 
So maybe then just a motion to postpone consideration of those two items um, until our next meeting. And then in the interim, you could provide whatever comments you have to the clerk about the, about the minutes. Okay. So do you want to make a motion to postpone? Sure. I'd like to make a motion to postpone um, these, the curricular subcommittee meeting notes from both May 10th and May 31st and invite, um, well, uh, to postpone them and we'll work on them in the back. That's right. Yeah. Okay. That's the motion to postpone consideration. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, any discussion about that? Um, okay. Um, obviously, so all, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Okay. I would only just caution the committee to have discussions directly with the clerk, not to have a electronic discussion amongst yourself so that it doesn't turn into a deliberation. Um, okay, so um, so the consent agenda is uh, concluded. Um, we now move into our reports and recommendations. And uh, the first report uh, for the evening is from our student representative. And I'm pleased to introduce our uh, new student representative, Michael Diaz, um, who is a, uh, well, he's a senior or will be a senior, or he's a senior because they've yes. all graduated. Um, so welcome, Michael, and uh, <coughs> the floor is yours to make a report as the student representative. Good evening, everyone. Um, to start off with, just some notes kind of about what's going on at the high school right now. Um, as the year, wind down, year winds down, we've got a couple events. Um, the girls' varsity softball team um, has won Western Mass, and they will be competing this weekend in their semifinals. Um, the musical showcase, which was postponed last week, um, will be happening tomorrow night, Friday, and will feature a number of local student bands and independent performances. Um, Blow Fall High students and the rest of the NHS student body are excited at the, um, the prospect of the NHS musical returning for next year. Um, after the cancellation this year, um, students are eager to get involved again and bring the iconic performance back. Um, Candidates Night was um, last night's forum. It featured six Massachusetts State Senate candidates and two representative candidates. Um, the event was held in the high school auditorium. It was hosted by various clubs, which include the Massachusetts High School Democrats, the Pioneer Valley Students for Gun Control, Environmental Club, uh, Students of Color Alliance, um, Gender and Sexuality Alliance, and the Feminist Collective. Um, there was a bake sale outside to raise funds for those clubs, as well as a table to register future voters. Um, turnout was good, um, with the majority of the lower bowl of the NHS auditorium being filled for the event. Um, Function Lust, the NHS student improv group, held their auditions for their next year's troupe last night, and their final performance is happening right now. <laughs> um, so that's about it from the high school. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and welcome again. Um, next item on the agenda is um, the um, Northampton Education Foundation Small Grant Awards. And I believe we have uh, Jennifer Sanders James here to present those to the board um, for our um, acceptance, the vote of acceptance. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm substituting for Dale Melcher tonight. She had to step out of town, so I'm here um, with very strict instructions. Um, to start, we would like to thank school committee member Laura Fallon for her representation of the school committee on the NEF board. We've appreciated her input, and we look forward to seeing her again. And um, Elena Frogmini is not here, but we also wanted to thank her for her service to NEF on the small grant and the large grant committee. Her insight was valuable, and we really appreciated it. That being said, uh, the board of the Northampton Education Foundation approved funding of $26,230 to the following eight applicants for the spring 2018 cycle. You should all have copies of the grants. I'm going to read them uh, briefly. I'll read a little bit about each of them. I am a little nervous. <laughs> um, so the first grant is uh, to Bridge Street School, building a mindful school community. This is the first year of this grant. Uh, it's to Sarah Koblen porth and Mr. Z. Um, this is based on the Mindful Schools curriculum at Bridge Street School. Uh, six teachers will be tr trained in the mindfulness curriculum as well as learn and practice mindfulness techniques that they can use personally and deliver to their classrooms. This grant is for $3,000. The second grant will be the Jackson Street Peacemakers with Jody Shaw and Joan Cameron writing it. 
the Peacemakers program is with the Meditation and Training Collaborative of the Community Action in Pioneer Valley. And the, this is a pilot program that will build on existing socio-emotional socio learning curricula and offer training to all fifth graders, teachers, and related staff at JSS. Uh, this is the first year of this grant and is $3,000. The third grant is at Florence Heights Meadowbrook Family Engagement Year 1. This is a collaborative grant between two schools and it's for $5,000. Uh, this collabor uh, excuse me, Mary Beth O'Connor and Holly Taylor are the writers of the grant. This collaboration between Ryan Road and Leeds School will offer a program of after school and family engagement events that will take place at the two Northampton low income housing developments. This project builds on successful NEF funded programming at each location with an increased emphasis on family engagement. The fourth grant is the summer reading access, it's in the mail. This is the final year of this grant. Uh, it's for Lead, Leeds and Ryan Roads. It was written by Mary Beth O'Connor and Rachel Ellis. And it's for $1,000. The goal of this project is to motivate approximately 40 students to read over the summer by supplying them with a steady stream of new and exciting books. Six books will be mailed over the course of the summer. Each, book will contain, each package will contain a book and a letter from a teacher. The uh, fifth grant is the JFK Day of Service, which just happened. Um, it's for twenty-eight thousand or twenty-eight hundred, excuse me, twenty-eight hundred ninety dollars, and it's written by Michael, I believe it's Susie, and Leslie Wilson. This is a school-wide day of community service, and intends to strengthen community connections and promote leadership and citizenship, build pride and self-confidence in the student body. The sixth, grade, the sixth grant is Finding Our Voice, year one, for $4,340. And this is a collaborative grant between JSS and Northampton High School. It's <coughs> written by Gwen Agna and Nick Ames. This is SASH, the Students Against Sexual Harassment from NHS will run a six to eight week after school program in the fall for fourth and fifth grade students from Jackson Street um, to help understanding sexual harassment and exploring ways to find their voice to stand up against sexual harassment. This is based off of a pilot program that happened this year. The seventh, grade, the seventh grant is REAL, Racial Equity and Learning, Northampton. This is the second year of this grant. It's $4,000, and it's written by Deborah, Deborah Keish and the NPS Anti-Racism <coughs> Affinity Group. This is a K through 12 grant. The mission of this grant is to support the school community through ongoing development and implementation of intentionally anti-racist culture and practices. During the second year, they'll continue to expand their community and school base, deepen connections with the school, and collect stories and writing through interviews and train core members of REAL to co-facilitate conversations about race and racism. And the final grant is an ELL -E acculturation project. This is the second year of this grant. It's $3,000. It's also K through 12, and it's written by Susan Sullivan. The purpose of this grant is to introduce ELL students, many of whom are immigrants or refugees, to U.S. history and culture through hands-on experiences and to have them document these experiences in writing, photos, and displays to share their work. This will involve possible field trips to different sites throughout the state. Uh, the NEF Board of Directors offers these grants as a gift to the mm. Northampton School Committee and we ask that you accept them. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well done. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, so uh, I would entertain a motion from the uh, vice chair. Uh, make a motion to accept the NEF, NEF small grant awards with much gratitude. Thank you. Okay. And it's been seconded by uh, Ms. Fallon. Any discussion or comments? Yeah. Yes, I, Ms. Burke. Um, this came up today when I saw the document sorry this is nothing this is all fantastic it's unbelievable okay. I love what everybody is doing and they're so connected and beautiful and they're hitting so many different grades um, I wanted I wasn't sure if I should step out I my I didn't actually know that my daughter had gotten is a part of one of these grants is it there could, a conflict of interest um, that I should you could just abstain from the okay. vote yeah I think that's okay. fine and you've disclosed it I've disclosed so. it <laughs> She didn't tell me that she okay. <laughs> okay. she's a high school. <laughs> I'm sure the jury will uh, take that into consideration. <laughs> trial. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Um, all those in favor of uh, 
gratefully accepting these uh, grants from NEF. Please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you so much again. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, the Northampton Education Foundation Endowment Fund Awards, um, and we have Danielle Carr Remdath here to make those presentations. Good evening and thank you. Um, the theme for this year's grant making was building the, the, building the divide, I'm also nervous, building the, the divide and building an inclusive future. And based on that theme, the Board of um, Northampton Education Foundation has approved the funding of $49,857 to four applicants for the 2018 grant cycle. I believe you all have copies of the details, but I want to give you a quick overview of each grant. So the title of the first grant is Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, a program to be launched here at JFK by a team of teachers and counselors led by Kathy Casal. PBIS is a program used by schools nationwide to, esta to establish proactive strategies for defining, teaching, and supporting appropriate student behaviors to create <coughs> positive school environments. JFK is participating in the Northeast implementation of this national program, and NEF approved $22,780 to support the first year of this project, then $10,000 for year two, and then $9,000 for year three. So this is a three-year program. The title of the second grant is Climbing Rocks, where ROCK stands for Reaching Our Children's Kinetic Sensors. This project is led by Annette Bischoff, physical education specialist at Leeds, and it will enhance physical education at Leeds and Ryan Road Elementary Schools by integrating rock climbing into the curriculum. Funding this program will ensure that all four elementary schools have comparable rock climbing equipment and pedagogy, pedagogy, and we want to stress that all students of all abilities will be able to participate and enjoy rocks. NEF approved $9,882 for this project. The title of the third grant is Makerspaces, a project that will establish makerspaces at Ryan Road, Jackson Street, and Bridge Street Elementary Schools. Makerspaces are workspaces that promote collaborative problem solving by using technology. Funding this project will ensure that all four elementary schools have makerspaces, comparable equipment, and programming. NEF approved $9,035 for this project. And the final grant is titled Sojourner's Truth in the 21st Century. Members of the Sojourner Truth Memorial Committee will work with fifth grade teachers to develop a social studies um, unit based on her life while incorporating local history. NEF approved $8,160 for the first year of this project with the hope that the teachers will create additional program to be considered by NEF next year. So that is the overview, and on behalf of NEF, I would like to offer these gifts um, to the schools, and I ask that you please accept them. Thank you so much. Make a motion to accept the NEF Endowment Fund Awards. So much gratitude. Thanks. Second. Okay. Been made and seconded. Any comments or? Okay. Um, okay. So all those in favor of accepting uh, gratefully these NEF Endowment Fund Awards, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to both of you, and obviously thanks to NEF for all the work that they do um, to support our public schools here in Northampton. Okay, the next item on the agenda is a uh, vote on the job description for a new athletics site manager uh, position. And I will um, ask uh, our athletic director, Kara. D. <clears throat> Sheridan to please step forward <clears throat> with congratulations on uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. marriage. She looks an awful lot like that other one we used to. <laughs> 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 um, thank you, everyone. Um, so first, I'd just like to say thank you um, to the school committee for approving the FY19 athletic budget, which does include um, this site manager position. And the purpose of this position is to assist in the facilitation of athletic events and after school sporting events. Um, I'm really proud to share with you that we have increased our presence at the local and state level. Northampton High School has a much bigger, bigger presence at our PBIAC, our local athletic board, and then also at the state level. Um, 
with that increased presence, it does create a little bit of a, a logistical problem in that I'm running back and forth from uh, Franklin often um, to represent us and then trying to come back to make sure that we're supporting um, our sporting events after school. Um, in addition to that, we are um, reinstituting our cheerleading program this fall and we're adding unified basketball. And so we're increasing our programming, which um, this position will help support uh, to continue to increase our programming for our students. Um, the last piece, and this is probably one I'm most proud of, is that we are bringing student athletes to different leadership conferences, wellness and sportsmanship summits, and I'd like to be able to give that even give more opportunity to our student athletes, athletes to be able to do that kind of work. Um, but it takes a little bit more time and planning, and so this position would help offset some of that afternoon um, activities, organizing. Uh, um, signing officials in, uh, checking in with the opponents, um, making sure our facilities are ready to go. I would still oversee all of this work and be at most events in the afternoon, but it does offer a little bit of wiggle room to be able to, um, to participate in the, uh, these other very important opportunities. Um, so that's sort of the rationale behind this position. Maybe we'll just put the approval of it on the floor and then we can have folks ask any questions um, in terms of uh, the description. Uh, vote, uh, make a motion to uh, approve the job description for the athletic site manager. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second. So do any folks have any questions about this? I know it was discussed during the budget process, but okay. I, I guess maybe I will ask a question only because looking through here, it, um, the, it, it's a stipend position. It's paid by season. How, how, how does that work as far as uh, it was built in the budget, a, a certain dollar amount, or is it per hour? Or um, So it was built into the budget as um, a stipended position. So it is, um, I think the, uh, the start is $1,892 per season. Um, and part of that is so that we can um, uh, use that person or use those people um, in different capacities. So they could be either here, let's say, in, during swim season helping support our swim season while I'm at basketball games or vice versa, that sort of stuff. Um, I envision it being somewhere between 10 and 12 hours a week um, to be able to support some of that work. Um, but we thought a stipended position would make more sense than an hourly wage. Do you feel like there's more um, responsibilities during different times of the year, spring, fall, or uh, winter? I think the responsibilities are would be comparable all three seasons. I think um, depending on the season in terms of um, the hours, they might shift. Mm -hmm. So in the fall and in the spring, it might be like four to six. But in the winter, it might be five to eight or something like that. So I think the, the timing of it would change, but based off of the, the sporting events involved, but the responsibilities wouldn't change. Do you see the same person doing the job throughout the entire school year? I think that would really help in terms of overall management, but I, I, I don't know. Right. Um, I, I think that would be wonderful, um, but I'm not sure how uh, what folks would be interested in depending on the season. And also I think some folks would like, if they really enjoy fall sports, to be in that environment might be different for them than if they don't love winter sports. Um, sure. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll just follow up with, if you take the stipend amount and divide it by the number of weeks and what you expect the number of hours to be, does that come out to a hourly wage that's reasonable for the um if you somewhere between 15 and 20 dollars an hour okay that I, I just didn't know how long it was and exactly what that if, number yeah if you Thanks. um the winter season is generally a little bit longer up two or three weeks longer than the fall or the spring um but the the jobs would be comparable so okay so any no other questions then i would ask uh for a vote uh, to approve the uh, job title uh, and position. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, and uh, uh, 
Sheridan, you have the next item on the agenda, which is to vote the approval of the unified basketball team user fee. So I'm really excited about uh, partnering with the MIAA and the Special Olympics to offer unified basketball in the fall. And in uh, having conversation with other area athletic directors who are also embarking on this for the first time, we envision uh, a six-week schedule for our um, unified basketball program, approximately two or three days per week, starting in late September and moving into uh, the first week in November. The MIAA has committed to offering um, a postseason style event at the end of that season. So it would be a large jamboree um, with uh, Western Mass, Central Mass, and um, depending on how many teams evolved, even Eastern Mass getting together somewhere in the middle to be able to bring all of these teams together. Um, they've done that with unified track, and it's gone very well. And so this, this will be our first jump into unified sports. Um, when trying to come up with a user fee that makes sense because we would like to treat this program like any other varsity sport at the high school, um, I, I compared the time and the schedule to a traditional basketball season. So usually it's about 12 weeks long. They practice or play six days a week. Um, and they also um, practice or play over uh, two vacation, school vacations. So I tried to um, look at all of those factors and my recommendation is that the students who are participating in unified basketball uh, would pay a, a user fee of $100 as opposed to the $205 we currently charge. And then students who um, qualify for reduced lunch would pay $15 um, as opposed to $35. And then the, uh, the fee would be waived for those students who qualify for a free lunch, which is the same as how we do it with all of our other sports. Okay. Um, do you want to make a motion to approve the fee and then second it and then we can ask questions? So I make a motion uh, to approve uh, approval of the, uni the unified basketball team user fee as presented by Ms. Sheridan. Okay. okay. Any questions about the fee, about the user fee? Any questions about unified basketball? Or? Okay. I, maybe I have a question about, um, once again, the, um, the equity. So um, the, the $100 would be used to offset the cost of the program? Um, to offset the officials, um, the coaches stipend, um, transportation. We have five schools in Western Mass who have already committed to this as well. So both Chicopee High School and Chicopee Comprehensive, Westfield High School, Ludlow, and Hoyoke. And we would like to be able to transport our student athletes to, to and from events the way we would with any of our other sports. So that would help offset the cost of that. And you envision how many competitions students would be involved um, in? Six to eight. <clears throat> six to eight. Yep, in the regular season and then I'm not exactly sure what the um, postseason jamboree looks like yet. We're still trying to figure that piece out. Um, but we'll be working together with um, the MIAA Special Olympics and um, the ADs involved to put that together. And we would be paying for a coach's stipend as well? We would. And is, would that be comparable to a junior varsity freshman or varsity coach's position? So, um, so I would recommend. Oh. If I could just jump in. Sure. It's actually the next item on the agenda. Oh. <laughs> the coach. But if you yeah, want to explain great. it for well, me, so I don't know. me going to my classes a few times <laughs> because it's blurry. So, so yeah, no, I can I can wait on my question or. <laughs> It's up Please. to you. Okay. Save me. Um, so um, <laughs> we have a coach's stipend structure already in place, and so looking at um, what their responsibilities would be, um, and considering and comparing that to what our um, other basketball positions would be like, I made the recommendation that the positions start at a level five, step one, which would be um, just a little bit over eighteen hundred dollars, I believe. Um, the the step one for a traditional basketball program is uh, somewhere around $3,200. Um, I make this recommendation that it's a little bit more than half um, because I think they're still going, the coach is going to have to coach basketball and also is going to have to um, negotiate the interesting dynamic of students with and without intellectual disabilities working together on the, on the court. So um, I, that's what I've offered to um, Dr. Provost and to the uh, the NACE uh, executive board as a recommendation, but I, th I think that's the next step. 
I was thinking only to uh, uh, a comparison to like a a freshman sport that might play a reduced schedule because sometimes it's hard to get teams to participate because they don't have programs and I know that they sometimes have reduced schedules with competitions and I was wondering if you know that idea of s structure and pay came into consideration when you're looking at this it didn't but that's because I try to fill our um, freshman and JV schedules with um, other games if our traditional opponents don't have a freshman or JV team. I try to find other teams to play. Sure. So I do try to get an 18 or 20 game schedule for the freshman team. Um, so I did not consider sure. the difference there. Okay, so, uh, oh, sorry, Ms. Coffin. I just wanna say real quick, thank you. Um, this, I, I really appreciate your actively thinking about this. This just sounds very reasonable. Sounds like you've, you've taken everything into account. The only thing I would mention is just when we advertise for kids or let them know what their fees are, mm -hmm. that you, um, I apologize because you probably thought of this already, but just to make it really clear that the reduced price has to do with the reduced schedule so that you don't create a reputation of it's because of the nature of the program, which I is see. exactly what we're trying to get out. I and it's now kids think so. Um, so I, but uh, wonderful, yeah. I did create a, so we use a family ID as a registration program and we can create multiple programs within that um, online system. So it's a separate registration process so that there is not that confusion about the user fee, but also um, in having conversations with folks already who've shown interest, it's merely been about the schedule and not anything else. Yeah. So. Okay, so all those in favor of um, approving the uh, Unified Basketball Team user fee, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And uh, the next item on the agenda is a vote to authorize the superintendent to draft an MOA on Unified Basketball Team coaching stipend. And as you just heard, um, Kara's proposal has been floated by NACE leadership and they would be amenable to entering into that kind of agreement if the committee also agreed. Okay. Make a motion to authorize the superintendent to draft an MOA on unified basketball team coaching stipend. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so that motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, now we move to a report from the curriculum subcommittee, and I'll turn to the chair, uh, Ms. Voss, to deliver. Oh, I jumped. I jumped. Sorry, I jumped G. That's a big jump, actually. Sorry, that's a really big jump. Um, so uh, we'll go to G, which is actually um, the appointment of a business administrator and uh, authorization of the superintendent uh, to negotiate a contract. And I'll turn this over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce you all to Cami Lamica. She is someone who. Um, I'm sort of getting reacquainted with when I was a member of a district that was part of the LVPEC, our paths would uh, sometimes cross, as you can imagine. They often want to have special education directors and business managers together in the same room because special education directors, you know, have an impact on the budget. Um, so my impression of her at the time was that she uh, always had uh, a lot of really good questions to ask about whatever the topic was. Um, I think she was perceived as a leader among her colleagues in the Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative. Um, I have since talked to a number of people that she's worked closely with and gotten really rave reviews um, about her. And I think um, going back to a couple of things that were said when we were all discussing desirable qualities and business managers, um, I think that she will be the type of person who, if I'm getting the committee um, excited about an initiative that we may not be able to afford, she'll be able to put the brakes on. Um, <laughs> I also think, um, you know, in terms of the people that we have, have met with o over the course of this process, she is the most candy-like of them all. <laughs> so, is that, that good or bad? <laughs> I think it's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So with that, I would turn it over to the committee. Okay, so um, 
Uh, Ms. Lamica, if you want to step up to the podium and um, did, um, and so I know you sent out information. So the screening committee in, did did some additional after our last uh, candidate. Uh, we reposted. Right, yeah, we re reposted the position. Yeah. We um, got some new applicants. We did Interviews. an interview. Okay. Um, and she's the, the, the candidate we're bringing forward. Excellent. Okay. Well, welcome. Um, I wondered if you wanted to just take a quick opportunity to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your background, and then we can have questions from the committee if there's anyone. Sure. Yeah. I thank Dr. Provost for those nice, kind words. We, we, we have been in the collaborative for a number of years uh, working together, um, so I'm very familiar with the area. Um, I've been a school business administrator for the last 18 years. Um, I'm a CPA by trade. Um, and I'm also, prior to being a school business administrator, worked for Melanson Heath, which is an audit firm that does municipality and school district audits. Um, so I was there doing my time for my CPA as well. So I've been familiar with municipal and school district finance for over 20 years. Um, I am the person that has the no button in my office, as what I'm known as. Um, it's one of those things that I do try to keep an eye on the finances, but try to involve the schools and get as much done for the schools as I possibly can in using whatever resources we can the right way. Um, so I don't know if you have any questions or. Sure. Um, are there questions from the committee? Could you could tell us about your, your coming to us from what district now? I'm coming from Quaybog Regional District. OK. It's a two-town regional. OK. Um, there's about 1,400 students. Uh, we take in an additional 200 students in school choice. Mm -hmm. um, it's a two-town region, um, so it has its dynamics between the two towns. Um, they are uh, very um, high, low-income numbers, mm -hmm. um, so we struggle with some demographics with our students. Um, we have a grant writer on on, in our district, so we have a large number of grants that we are able to obtain, and it's an innovation school district. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been able to get a number of grants through that process as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any charter schools in your area? Um, the closest one has been in Sturbridge, mm -hmm. that was just recently opened last year in Old Sturbridge Village. Um, it has not drawn a lot of students from our district. However, um, they accept a lot of uh, Southbridge students, which we also accept in school choice. So that's mm -hmm. where a little bit of the competition has come for us. Okay. Excellent. Mr. Kyle. Quick question. So thank you for applying and your interest in here. What, what is your interest? What, what, what attracts you to working in Northampton? Um, I've been familiar with Northampton for quite a while, um, having been in the business district and talking with the business managers that have been here for the last 18 years. Um, I think Northampton's got a, a, a good reputation for their school districts. They've tried to work out with the finances over the years, um, and, and that's an important thing to me, to be able to work out those pieces and have those conversations with different groups, whether it's the union, the parents, um, the administrators, um, to try to move the district forward, and that's an important piece for me. Any other uh, questions? Candy, do you have any uh, comments <laughs> about uh, candy your, like. your, your potential uh, successor? Like, I'm not sure candy like is the word that we use. <laughs> I've actually known Cammie since she started in West Springfield many years ago, um, and we've attended a number of conferences together, and it was actually a pleasant surprise when I got the first phone call saying, talk to me about your position. So. Um, I do think she'll be a good match for the district. Not sure about the candy like, mm -hmm. but okay. we'll find out. <laughs> I broke the mold. So. <laughs> There's only one candy. My husband says all the time. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so if there are none other qu no other questions, then I, I guess I would ask if the vice chair sure. would make a, a motion. Make a motion to appoint business administrator and to authorize the superintendent to negotiate a contract. Okay. So the motion then would be to appoint Ms. Lamica as our uh, next business manager subject to uh, contract negotiation with the superintendent. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Congratulations and hopefully welcome to, to Northampton Public Schools. Thank you very much. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now we'll go to uh, Chair Voss and the Curriculum Subcommittee um, for a report. And I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. So the Curriculum Subcommittee met on May 31st, and we had two major um, things on our agenda that I will 
briefly summarize. First, a high school senior who has now graduated, Hazel Ethier, gave a report on her senior project, and it was well attended, and um, many people, including myself, commented that she presented it in a really, um, really well, and her teachers were incredibly supportive and got her to the point of um, really accomplishing a lot for a high school senior. Um, and I'll just share with you the title of her report and a couple sentences from the abstract to give a sense of what it was about, and then I'll move on to the second part of our meeting. So her report is titled Integrated Math Analysis at Northampton High School, and her words in the abstract, um, her, her results showed that students from the integrated math curriculum tended to have significantly lower final grades and honors pre-calculus than students who learned through the traditional curriculum. The distributions of grades also differed as students from integrated math received more C's and fewer A's and D's than students from the traditional curriculum. And just to summarize that final sentence, they were more squished. So the students in the newer integrated math had fewer at the extreme A's and D's, more in the middle, and the students in the traditional curriculum were more spread out but had a significantly higher number average. So that's what she presented, and um, that was the first part of our meeting, that presentation. The second part of our meeting was longer than the first, and it addressed the topic that you all sent to us, uh, um, that the high school students have worked hard on this year regarding the AP exams. and. I started the meeting by sharing the information that I think Dr. Provost emailed everybody, but I think it's worth clarifying where that came from and who said it and what it says because um, we did spend a little time on it and I think it was an important background. So at the, um, I, I'm not summarizing everything from the year because I think we've talked a lot about the AP issue, but one of the things that came up at the student-led discussion and other times in this group was is it legal for us to require students to take the AP exam and there are two responses we got that for me were really important in leading this discussion one was a legal representative so the legal office at DESE which is a department of elementary and secondary education and this is a draft advisory it hasn't been formally put out there officially but I asked her what that meant and it's part of a very very big advisory that it just hasn't made it as a priority for them to approve but I specifically asked her if there were any um, controversies about it and I was told absolutely not everybody thinks this is um, very accurate. And what it says is students who enroll in an AP course in high school generally are expected to take the AP exam, sometimes as the final exam for the course. The AP exam is administered by the Educational Testing Service, a private organization, and requires payment of fee. Public schools may not assess the exam fee as a condition of the student enrolling in the AP course based on the general rule that schools may not charge a fee for students' participation in required or elective courses. As such, the district can require students to take the exam, provided the district <coughs> pays all associated fees. And there's one little phrase in there that we got hung up on a little bit, um, some of, uh, g based on the general rule, and that wasn't clear where that came from. So I reached out to MASK, and the person I talked to there reached out to um, Mike Gilbert, some of you might know him, he's a field director, and he wrote back, I'm not going to read the entire email, the committee members have seen it, but I think it's important because he addresses what that general rule is. It comes from the Massachusetts Constitution, and this is what he writes. Under the Massachusetts Constitution, all students are guaranteed a free public education. Massachusetts has a long history of laws, regulations, and case law that have established the interpretation that any course or activity that a student will receive academic credit for on their transcript or as a requirement for promotion or graduation cannot be charged a fee for. Therefore, if the Northampton School Committee requires that students who take an AP course must take the AP exam in order to receive academic credit for the course, then the Northampton School Committee must pay the exam fee. Under the premise that all students are entitled to a free public education, I see this as a really simple concept. We charge fees for busing, sports, and other extracurricular activities because these are not required by law or as an equivalent or promotion or graduation. So I shared that with the group, and we had a really, I think, solid hour and a half-ish um, conversation. We had 
six AP teachers participating, and um, it, they, their need for having students take an AP exam varied greatly amongst them. They shared how different subject AP exams differed amongst them and why they either thought it was important or not important. And I think we probably wouldn't have come to a consensus of this is you know what should work for everybody, but the general feeling was that um, money, if we had to pay for it out of our budget, money is better spent um, on other things. For example, another history teacher was what one of the AP teachers said. And together we wrote this motion that I'll read that I want to put forward um, for, for you to consider. Um, and I will get it out. Um, I have two versions of it, but okay. So the motion. is the following. Um, that all AP exams administered by the Educational Testing Service will be optional beginning with the 2018 to 2019 academic year for a two-year pilot period during which all Northampton High School transcripts will continue to use an AP designation. This pilot program will be revisited by the school committee at the end of the two-year period in consultation with administrators and AP teachers. Okay, so um, that concludes your committee report and, yeah. and you're making that as a motion. That's right. Excellent, okay. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Okay, okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? So I just had a few questions. Is Mr. Gilbert an attorney? Is he legal staff at MASC? I don't think so. He's a field officer. Okay, but so he looked into the... Um, so did he consult with counsel? Because I just, yeah. you know, if I'm taking legal advice... He, um, he sent us this email, so you've, okay. you've seen it. And I Great. spoke with our field officer, Pat Correa, and she said he was very experienced at this. And the person that I spoke with at DESE is... Um, not a lawyer, but a, I, I don't know that I know her title. Okay. Did, she, did she email you or send you anything in she, writing? So, yes. So we, um, our legal, Layla reached out to, um, had somebody in her office, also not a lawyer, reach out to Desi, and we got that same um, paragraph back because I asked Dr. Provost if we could find out what the legal aspect of this was. This was probably back in April, and we got that draft advisory. But it's still a draft, though, has not We didn't know what that meant, so that's why I called. I wanted to understand what does a draft advisory mean, and that's when this woman, it turned out I got through to the same exact person that advised Layla's person. But it's and not actually an advisory yet, hasn't been issued. It's a draft advisory that's part of what was described to me as a very large package of um, various policies that they're recommending. And she said, I said, is there any reason that it hasn't been passed. It's just not a high priority. Is there anything controversial about this, what I just read you? Right, but it's not, but it's not actually a functional. I mean, in terms of regulation, right. it hasn't been promulgated, so it's right now That's it's right. just. I mean, I think part of the right. legal part is something that, that we all have to decide what makes sense in terms of what the Constitution says, what the law says, what a free public education means. And um, there might be varying views on it. But that's the feedback I got from the, stu the two state agencies that I know we can go to for help. And I didn't read you all of Mike's email, but I think it's, it's, it's pretty telling. Um, I, I just, I was, re I read his email, but I'm just not, yeah. I'm not as familiar as he is with the clear demand for a free public education. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's quite a bit of law in the Constitution, um, but it talks about cherishing, right? The, the, the education clause is not, it does, there's no words to the effect of free public education. So I guess I would just want to have our legal counsel, like actually our legal counsel, be asked to provide an opinion on it before we, before we act, because I think- I mean, She did, I can read it too. Yeah. That's where we started. Let's just start. Um, so you'll recall in the draft advisory, there was something called a general rule. Mm -hmm. So that's what she's referring to. She said, she, meaning the person at DESE, was unable to identify what the source of the general rule actually is. 
And from what our firm could find out, it appears that there is no affirmative prohibition under the statutes or regulations on a public high school's requiring the payment of and taking the AP exam with respect to its AP classes. A review showed that there are a number of public high schools in Massachusetts that have such a policy. In light of the above, I would recommend that if the school committee desires to continue its policy of requiring taking of the AP exam to complete the course, that it look into subsidy options to help offset the cost to students. Although I don't know what the partnership criteria is, Mass Insight has, the pro has a program where fees for low-income students in partnering schools could be reduced to as much as $5 for exam. Also, you may want to ensure that you have equivalent courses, such as honors courses, are available. And I think that last sentence is really important. Also, you may want to ensure that you have equivalent courses, such as honors courses, are available. Because I also, in this process, talked to another field officer, independent of the ones I've already cited. And what she told me is, um, you can have your current policy as long as you have an equivalent course a student can take that does not require the AP. And I'll give you an example. So in our high school, you take biology freshman year. Now you want to take an advanced version of biology. Not ecology, not some of the other stuff we offer, biology. Um, your only choice is AP biology, and your only choice to take that advanced biology is to pay this, for a lot of people, close to $100 fee. And so what this, this phrase from Layla is implying, and what this other field officer said was, your policy on charging for the AP is okay as long as you have another equally challenging class. Maybe it's called advanced honors biology. And students can pick which they take, and if they pick that other one, they don't have to pay the AP fee. And I think I had shared that with um, the committee, and the teachers didn't really want to go down that route, it felt. I think they were pretty, I, I mean, there's limited resources, right? So what that's if, the what advice if you I subsidize the What if you subsidize the exam for people who can't afford it? I mean, we did talk about that in the, in the discussion, and other committee members, feel free to chime in if, if, if you remember this differently, but um, I think what we really heard from the students and what came up at this discussion, which Elena was there, Hazel was there, um, and there was a lot of opinions, very varied opinions from the teachers. Um, it's not necessarily the, low, the lower income kids, it's the middle class people who need to pay for four or five AP exams. And maybe they have siblings also taking three or four um, courses. And so all of a sudden these families are being asked to pay hundreds of dollars for their kids to take a, the rigorous class they want to take. And that seemed to be more of the problem. And so um, I don't know how you... Yeah, I, don't, I, I, think, I think the discussion of the whether or not to have require the test is a good discussion and we should have it. I, I, don't, I don't frankly buy the constitutional argument that's being posited by this non-lawyer. I just, I don't, I think that if you are requiring AP as part of your curriculum, then I think you, you trigger that constitutional argument that you're basically requiring people to take the class. Um, that's why, you know, charging for sports and charging for things that aren't part, you don't have to take an AP course to graduate from North <coughs> High School. You, you just don't. It's not a requirement. So I, I just think that that, I think that's a, I, I, again, I didn't ask the city solicitor to do any research. I didn't want to spend any money on it. But I just, I, I'm, I find that to be a dubious argument. Um, but then again, because I, and again, I haven't seen any case law on it either. But, um, but that's just my take on it. I, but again, I, that doesn't take away from the fact that should we still require the test or not, or not require the test. Because I think that if you're subsidizing it for people um, that can't afford it, then I think that then that is the key piece here that we're not discriminating against people. But again, I don't know how you, if you're going to say that, you know, define middle class and we don't have subsidies for people that are. I mean, we have really well defined subsidies in our school system that we apply yeah. equally. So that's just where the challenge becomes. So I'm hearing from people who are not getting subsidized yep. and they're really struggling with mm -hmm. it. Okay, and I think. Um, their perspective is this is hard to afford. The other perspectives that came out from many of the teachers that really thought it should be optional was also that kids are having trouble studying and doing well on the number of AP classes, that they're, tests that they're trying to take, and that they would really like the kids to be able to focus on the ones that they want to take. So there was that flavor. Was mm -hmm. We explored a lot. And I'm partly I'm bringing this up because I... Um, you know, it, it's it's fine. It's fine to disagree on things. I, I I tend to think that the case law is coming. Um, that 
when we had the grant from 2008 to 2013, almost every community started requiring AP exams. And um, a lot of communities, and you can go, the students presented it to us, have gone back on that and don't require them anymore, but some still do. Mm -hmm. And I happen to know um, another community in this area, they're having the similar conversation right now. They currently require it, and they're having the same conversation we're having. Um, so I personally think if, I'm going to read it. I wasn't going to, but I'm going to read it, and this is where I'm at with it, and I'm one of ten, but it says, this is what Mike Gilbert wrote, if I were a Northampton parent of a high school student, I would immediately challenge a requirement to pay the exam fee in court. AP courses are not simply about passing an exam, but rather they are about challenging students in a particular subject area with more depth to the curriculum and requiring more work of the student. The AP exams are only one measure. Okay, so, but the point is, there are People who do this for their jobs, they think about these policies, they work at DESE, they, this is what they do, and they're pretty much saying this is a really bad policy. We don't agree with it. We have a draft policy that doesn't agree with it. So that's where I'm at. And that's I, think, fine. I think our committee came back, um, and Ms. Burnham helped a lot word this, with this idea of a two-year trial policy, partly for that reason. Case law might come about in the next couple of years. It, covers us to a certain extent. Um, we've heard from a lot of students that they'd like to try it a different way. And um, that is why we worded it as a two-year trial policy to be revisited by the school committee, the teachers, and the administration um, to see where we are. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm, I'm all fine with that. I mean, I'm fine. I just, I, I reject the notion that what we're doing is unconstitutional. That's just. But then again, I'm, I just play a lawyer on TV. I'm not a lawyer either, so. Yeah, but you but just I, take an oath to uphold the Constitution. <laughs> yes. I did. Yeah, I did. yes. Um, well, let me turn it over to a lawyer and see what he thinks. Yeah, I have a, a an observation. That, um, it seems like if you, well, it sounds like there were some people who were opposed to the idea of teaching a, uh, a comparable course. It seems that if you make the um, test optional, you are, in fact, then teaching a comparable course in the same classroom, you know, because you have the kids who are taking the test and the kids who aren't taking the test. And whether you label it differently or not, it would be the same thing. In other words, whether, you, in other words, whether what goes on the transcript at the end of that course was two different things depending on whether or not you took the test or whether it's the same thing. Um, in terms of the teaching and the motivation of the students and everything else, it seems like it's the same thing as teaching a parallel course. If, it, if in fact your parallel course was the equivalent. And so I was curious, what were the objections to teaching a parallel course? So um, we, we discussed that. And Hardly though, not much. Well, it came, yeah, I think it, it came up. It wasn't, it, I mean. It came up and yeah. I mean, we can talk about it more and he yeah. asked what the objections were yeah. and I'll share, yeah. I'll share with you the objections I heard and maybe other people heard other ones. Um, I, uh, in the background, I did ask the students about that exact question and what they said, so this didn't happen at our meeting, but I, I researched that because I viewed that as a possible solution too. Um, that the AP designation on their transcript means something to colleges when, when they're applying in terms of the content that was in the class and the students didn't want to lose that. And that's pretty typical at a lot of high schools. So if you go to Amherst, you can get the AP designation without being required to take the test, or lots of schools. So there'd be like a trademark infringement action there. there, I mean, there it seems to me there's, so, there's a potential legal action, no matter what you do, as long as you can use the word AP, which is, as far as I know, a trademark thing of the advanced placement business. I think I. I mean, they have money in this. I, I can tell you um, that has not become an issue. I mean, it was I, an issue. Uh, sorry, it, it, I think that was something that came up when this practice started. There's <laughs> there was. A, about 10, 15 years ago when they said, if you're not going to require it, should you still be able to use the AP designation? And I think that that was somehow mitigated by requiring certain training to like, there's the, by, by them having some oversight. AP got some money. <laughs> yeah, so I think it, they figured out a way that, that they felt comfortable with having right. that trademark used. Right. But So that, that definitely was brought up. And right. So anyway, I'm just, I'll, I guess what I'm saying is if, the, if, there are, if, the, if there are teaching kinds of objections, having a parallel course, in other words, in terms of 
you know, the difficulty of sort of teaching one group of students who are planning to take this test versus teaching another group of students who are not planning to take this test and teaching them all at the same time. If there's a, if there's a, because I, if there's a teaching reason for not to do that, I mean, that's the, the, the you know, then if there's not a teaching reason not to do that, then I don't really see any reason not to do it because, I mean, that is our business, um, you know. And then, and then I don't really know. I don't. I agree. I don't think it's a constitutional issue right offhand because it's not. We don't require anybody to take AP Tech classes in order to graduate. So, uh, yeah. Mr. Just a quick, quick. I mean, the first thing is I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the secondhand relating of what the teachers thought. I mean, to me, this is an issue about teaching. I'm I'm uncomfortable with informing all of our AP staff a few days before the end of the year that they will be teaching a substantially different course next year. I mean, some of them seemed comfortable, some seemed less comfortable, and I don't know whether any were invited to speak to the full committee tonight, but to me, it seems like that's the foremost piece for me, is that we have experts in our school system who've taught AP courses for years, some for decades, and it would be important to me as a school committee member to hear from them that they're ready to go forward with this. I think it is an important issue about equity, and I think we're trying to address that. Um, and I think that we can go further as a committee in terms of trying to appropriate money to make that happen. But I think in terms of making the programmatic change, I wouldn't want to do it right now without hearing from, um, you know, to hear from those people who will be actually making it, making the change in the classroom. The other thing is we are going to make the change. I'm actually really happy because neither of my sons can play in the band without instruments that have to be serviced. And I'm happy to hear that we will be paying for all of those services you know, for the next year, which is going to be hundreds of dollars. But you know, again, if you can't play in the band without an instrument, then it would seem like the same logic would apply. You can't charge a student for being in the band, and if they can't be in the band without an instrument, then the district would be on the hook for those costs. So I can, you know, again, I think it's, in terms of the, the legal argument, I think that we should be careful about pushing that too far. But again, coming back to the more important issue is how do we do right by the students? Um, again, we had a presentation from the students. Uh, it, was, it was well done. Um, they presented their views and their research. We've had a lot of, I've, I've heard a lot of secondhand reporting of what teachers think about this. And I, you know, and I think I would be comfortable after hearing from them. Unfortunately, we're coming to the end of the year, so it may be hard to get them into our next meeting. Did you look at who was at our meeting? Oh, I did. Okay. And again, so, since you just told me that the minutes were not accurate, right? Oh, you just, oh no. you, you just, you just, right? You just pulled the minutes out and said they were inaccurate. I can't read the minutes and say that's fine. That you can read who was it, who was at the meeting is accurate. Well, no, but but again, they were at the meeting. But again, have they been informed of your proposal? We, the proposal was made with them. And so we sat and together constructed the motion. And all of that, well, I'll let a different. Yeah, I mean, I just. There. I'd like, to, maybe somebody else can describe what the teacher's responses were. And were those, those the, all of the AP instructors were there? Uh, I. Well, that were in the minutes. Is that all of the AP instructors at Northampton? I asked the principal via the superintendent to please invite all of the AP instructors. They were not all there, but a majority was, and there was definitely every different view. I would, well, a range of views were represented. Okay. So okay. again, it, my problem is that we've had a range of views, but it's very different if you're talking about something in the abstract that might happen versus being presented with the school committee has decided to make this this change and you will deal with it. There was not a single one, my sense, and I'd like to hear other people who were in the room what they thought, that felt that a two-year trial period was at all, um, I mean, they didn't, they didn't object to the two-year trial period proposal. Did you ask them to communicate that to the committee in any way? Because again, I, I'm just, it's hard for me to hear hearsay about, you know, what they said when you said there was a diversity of opinion. Uh, it's just it's hard for me to take that. Okay, so um, another member of the committee wants to speak. Dr. Provost, did you want to just yeah. say? Uh, just I just want to correct the record on one point, um, which is what I actually did, and then I'll also share my recollection, which I know is hearsay and also subject to, you know, possibly <laughs> erroneous memories. But I recalled a conversation we had about not wanting to have all the AP teachers there, but wanting to have all the perspectives represented. So. I intentionally asked Mr. Lombardi to bring two who were pro. 
um, AP test requirement and two who are against AP test requirement. And then he sort of extended it and I believe added one person who was kind of like half and half. Um, so okay. it wasn't all AP and that was intentional. That was what I did based on what I thought the, the wishes of the subcommittee were. Mr. Kaufman, did you want? Do yes, you want? I would. I, I, so um, I guess I have several things I want to say. First, I'm, I'm really confused with what you're saying. Maybe you misinterpreted. The, the only thing we voted on was what Susan mentioned, which is making the fee optional and giving students and making no test change, op making test, test, test optional. Test optional, sorry, and making no change to the existing policy of providing students with AP credit. So if, if they don't take the test, they would still get AP credit. And the way I understand that's been happening for a while. I was confused personally. I thought kids didn't get any credit. So we decided that. Um, this conversation about a parallel course or teaching another course, that was just not part of what we discussed. It was maybe brought up a little bit. The really, the, um, I, I'm glad that Susan brought up the financial piece. But what was amazing to me was that we discussed, not, not the financial piece, I'm sorry, the legal piece. We discussed the legal piece in the first, like the introductory comments was part of Susan's presentation. And I was thinking to myself, boy, this is, might be a really quick meeting if everybody agrees with one interpretation versus the other. And Dr. Provost presented a different interpretation. We're hearing those today. But we then engage in what was one of the best conversations I've been involved with in a long time. And I'll tell you why. Because we had this great representation from teachers, from Dr. Cheevers, who isn't always at our meetings. And she had a lot to say. Dr. Provost did. We did, the three committee members. We had a number of teachers and students. And the level of respect and the level of people's ability to talk about things in particular, it was, it was clear that some of the AP teachers had never really talked about AP and what they require and how they teach and how important the test is. And their interpretations were different. That in and of itself was rather insightful. But there wasn't necessarily everybody on the same page. But by the end of an hour and a half, I'll say two things. It was, you know, it's just my interpretation. But everybody was very happy that the conversation occurred, that there was really good, rigorous, intellectual sort of debate. And it really, really felt like when the three of us voted uh, in agreement with us that there was an overwhelming amount of um, agreement amongst folks. And after having two presentations, at least from students, having a forum with parents, receiving a number of emails from parents, having us spend two hours meeting with a bunch of other professionals, I, I, I just find it, it like this has been a rigorous sort of analysis. This has been a rigorous attempt on our part to get a full, rounded, robust nature of people within hearing perspectives. And we read something that was really positive and, and really a, a, um, an exemplary sort of practice of how a subcommittee such as ours can take in all this information, research it, and present it back to the full group. What the shame is that we're talking about the legality piece, which had really very little to do with our conversation. We discussed it, and we got off it so quick. I don't know if, you, if Molly and Susan agree with me, but most of the discussion was if we never had that conversation about the legal issue. It had to do with the importance of the exam, who should take it, who shouldn't take it, what we would lose from it. I personally was very interested in hearing what, the, what we would lose by taking it away, because up until then, I heard nothing but proponents of people saying, this isn't fair, you shouldn't offer it. Um, a few people mentioning maybe it's not legal, have you checked into it? But most of it had to do with really deep, th deep thoughts about the pros and cons. And I would say that of the people who were at the meeting, everybody was happy with the outcome. It was a wonderful process. It took some time. We reached consensus. It was a model sort of example. And the legal, the legal piece of it, I, I mean, we're, we're talking about it, but I wouldn't change my mind one way or another. I think that the people who made the arguments and the considerations over it were, had very little to do with the legal piece. And I, I just want to be clear, I, I appreciate all of that, and I said that I think that's the important piece to hear. It was just that the, the presentation was framed with a very solemn reading of an opinion from a non-lawyer about it being unconstitutional. Yeah. And, 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 and I'll just, that's how the whole conversation was framed, yeah. And, and I'll apologize. Part of that was just we don't have a chance to talk, mm -hmm. and I, I, so I'm, I apologize if I presented too much of that. Um, but to explain why I feel like because I can't communicate any of this with people outside of this setting because of open meeting law, 
I had really tried to do a lot of background research on this mm -hmm. and to really understand where it was coming from yep. Yep. and try to make the conversation, you know, take keep track of everything. So that's why I shared mm -hmm. all that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just explain how, why I reacted yeah, yeah, the way yeah. I reacted. Uh, so. And I know you've had your hand up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to say just it's going to be very quick. So um, first off, uh, Downey and I were on subcommittee curriculum uh, for two years. And I, I wonder if other people who are still on, was anybody else ever on? Okay. So I just yes, want to say, no, not two years ago. For the past two years, Downey and I were on the curriculum subcommittee. And I just feel I was like. on the subcommittee last year? <coughs> is that what you're asking? Who was on the last year? No, no, no. Before you came. Before. Yes, okay. okay. Yes, because you took over midtime. Yeah. Um, the meetings that I was with with Downey, all of those people were there also. Teachers were there, Nancy Cheevers was there, the principals who it affected were there. Um, so this, I just want to sort of clarify that that is how the curriculum subcommittees that meetings that I have been a part of have always been run. Um, in answer to this question about coming up with alternatives, I don't, that was not something that we were charged with and I sort of just want to say that we were just charged with talking about the AP fees. So, you know, sort of as a sort of bringing that back, um, I think that it's something certainly that it's impossible not to begin this conversation without sort of, you know, playing around with those ideas. But again, that's not for us to decide. That's something that can come from the teachers and the administrators and to, to sort of decide. But what and I'm saying is that if you make the test optional, you have decided that because the kids who are not taking the test are now taking well, the alternative course. Okay, so that so can be a discussion. That discussing. Okay, but can I just finish one last thing? <laughs> Which is, um, I'm going to really disagree with um, my honorable colleague. Um, the teachers were there, they expressed their opinion, but ultimately, we were the people, you know, I was the person who proposed a two year pilot, sort of looking at these other school districts and looking at how they do it and trying to figure out is there something that you know maybe we're missing and if we do a pilot that would be a chance for people to try it but after it was put on the table the teachers did not weren't like yay or they they didn't express anything so i'm going to say that i have no idea what the teachers feel and that that would be really mind reading if i was able to i was paying attention and i heard what they had to say so i interpret that differently so if you, I, I was there, I heard what they had to say. It was a conversation that till the bitter end, everybody was conversing. So I don't know why I interpreted it differently than you, but I don't, I, I'm not a mind reader. I just know what I heard. Um, there were other options, by the way, Howard, that got brought up. One of them that was really hot in, in terms of what you're saying was the, I think Dr. Shivers brought it up maybe initially. Um, and then it got a lot of discussion was that kids who would opt out of taking the exam would still take an exam. And the teachers talked about how that might happen. Some said they had access to uh, last year's exam, an older exam. It wasn't really clear where, what they were going to use. Um, we reached that point where it seemed like it was an idea that was gaining a lot of traction. But we, I think Susan brought up, or Molly brought up, that that's not really what our charge was that our charge was just to talk about the fee, that if that was an aspect that was going to replace, so that's something that wanted to go into account, that that would be um, something that the teachers and the educators would need to decide. Not the fee, the test. The test. Correct. So. Yeah. yeah. So that item in and of itself might come back. There seemed to be a lot of interest in it. There seemed to be a lot of um, respect of the <coughs> fact that they can make that decision, from what I interpreted. So that might happen if, if this passed and the pilot goes through. So it would be, it would be the, the folks that were seeing some value in the exam felt like that might be an alternative that would be uh, appealing to some folks. But I don't know, obviously, how that decision will be made. Ms. Hennessy. Yeah, uh, so I am an AP teacher, which informs my thinking. And in a school, that requires the test, which also informs my thinking. But it, it is, without the money, it's curricularly really a good idea to have the test. It's a secure document. I mean, I had, the kids have access to last year's exams. I mean, it's a, a good program. They get to study for this. It's, um, the issue is the money. I mean, it's for the course itself as a 
a pedagogical tool. The test is, I get great data from it. Um, it's super. It's amazing. It informs my instruction for the following year. Um, it's a good investment of my time as a teacher. Um, I know where my weaknesses are, where my students' weaknesses are, where it was my fault. It's very useful. It is not a question that it's not useful. If we weren't talking about money, we would not be saying make mm -hmm. this test optional. We wouldn't mm -hmm. be, I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like we deal with the equity issue with the free and reduced lunch. And so my so that's confusing to me a little bit. I do understand that this, the burden goes on students who are choosing to take a lot of tests, and I get that that's real. I get it. I have the same thing. But I worry then about equity in the other way, that now are we going to be, hopefully we'd get more students taking it. I would hope that if we do do the two-year model, <laughs> we that data, then who's not going to take the test? That to me is also an equity issue because students do, I have many, many, I, I literally countless students who graduate a half year early or who end up being able to take so many more courses um, in their major because they didn't have to take some introductory classes that I would I would want to make sure that the students who are opting not to take the test that we're looking at who they are too because mm -hmm. that is an equity issue too so I do feel like we deal with the equity issue with the free and reduced lunch so we're talking about kids who are choosing to take a lot of exams and I get it, it's expensive but we wouldn't be talking about an optional exam if it wasn't about money it is a curricularly mm -hmm. important thing to do so I just want to throw that out there because we're getting. I'm feeling it's getting a little bit muddled. But. Okay. Yeah. Other, yes. I just want to follow up. My sense of the room after we had this discussion, so people, we did have this range of teachers, and I thought it was a really great discussion. I learned a lot, too. Um, as the person running the meeting, I was trying to be super sensitive to how they felt about the motion, and those of us there know I was writing it, I was asking for input. The teachers gave a lot of input into the writing of the motion and helped word parts of it and pointed out things that we hadn't thought of in the way it was worded. They said, students will figure out that, you gotta word it that way. So I felt like we had a lot of input and I was trying really hard to get input, but I also appreciate that we don't know that for sure. Um, you know, they didn't have a lot of time to digest it. Their principal was sitting there. So I don't know for sure, but I just want to assure people that while the process was going on, I was trying very hard to get their input. And it was a unanimous recommendation of the committee, correct? Yes, and, and before we voted, I asked the teachers, do you have any concerns? Is there anything else you want to um, say about this? I mean, it was a very inclusive, um, writing of that motion. But they definitely have concerns. I mean, we did the best that we could, but yes. there are concerns. Yes, yes. there are concerns. Okay. All of the things that people have brought yes. up are concerns. Yeah. And that's why... That's why they're great teachers. <laughs> and, and, and I agree with everything Ms. Hennessy just said. And we've all read the emails from the parents. We've all heard what the students have to say. I mean... Okay. Yes, Mr. Zahowski. You know, as I'm sitting here listening, I'm trying to see where I think this, you know, where the root of this came from. And I know that you referenced it earlier on. You know, the NIMSI grant was huge. Um, it offered an opportunity <coughs> to offer school districts money and finances in order to provide advanced placement opportunities in math and science for students. And it encouraged students who may not have considered taking an AP to go ahead and take it because resources were available. Um, the tests were paid for, and um, I know even in, at least in my district, students were awarded cash uh, awards for getting a qualifying score. Um, and that had to channel some of the instruction, at least in my experience, from what teachers were doing to get AP trained, and then to offer the course, and then to offer the support. Sometimes that was happening after school or on weekends to get students ready to take the test in order for them to really work hard to get that qualifying score. I think what happened is that in order to do that, um, uh, what we had to work with as far as our teaching staff, they needed to either start teaching AP courses or continue to offer the academic course. And at least in my experience, I was looking through the program of studies here in Northampton, that um, those other courses that were once offered, like an honors course, um, were extinguished in order to either 
have an AP or just have an academic. And so I looked at chemistry, for example, here in Northampton High School. You can take chemistry, you can take honors chemistry, or you can take AP chemistry. But then I looked at other core courses, and you can take physics, or you can take AP physics. And there aren't those options for those students that don't want to necessarily take that high-level, rigorous course, but they want to be challenged more than just taking the academic course. And I feel like part of the solution, at least in my opinion, and I know it requires maybe a thinking of the way that we're delivering our instruction in, <coughs> in these areas, is to look at, you know, why are we offering chemistry, <coughs> honors chemistry, and AP chemistry, but we're just offering physics and then AP physics without having an honors physics? Because I think there are students who would take honors physics because they want the extra challenge. They've been in the academic course and feel like they're not getting enough, and the teacher may not be differentiating up enough for those students, but would benefit from being in that course, but don't want to take the AP because of the cost or because of the, you know, the college level course that it's it's being billed as. Can I clarify one thing? Sure. So in our school, honors commit you. When you go to take chemistry, you either take chemistry or honors chemistry, but they're the same. You can't take both of them. So it's at that intro level of chemistry that you have a choice of chemistry or honors chemistry. And you can't take them both. So then if you want to take anything beyond that one semester of chemistry, your only choice is AP chemistry. So it's not like you go from chemistry to honors chemistry to AP. It's just the jump to AP. That's all there is. And um, you know, I think that is left over from about 2010 to 12-ish, there was honors flavors, as you're saying, of a lot of these subjects. There was honors English for freshmen. There was honors American history. Um, and people could choose how much of a rigorous course they wanted. And that's really gone away. And maybe your interpretation is right. We've put the resources at the AP level. But a lot of these subjects in our high school, if you want to take a rigorous, more advanced, that's the only choice you have. That's, what I, that's my point. Yes. You know, yeah. I think there used to be more options for those students yeah. than now. And I'm, I'm not blaming the NIMSI for that, but there was definitely a shift to move courses to that rigorous level that had the AP because there was funds mm -hmm. that was supporting the training of teachers, and that funding got pulled away. And we keep, we keep the programming, and I get it. it it's, it's great for students. But there is a section of students who are taking AP now that maybe can't afford it, that feel like they want to have that rigorous challenge and experience, but don't want to take the test because they don't think they can score well on it. And maybe they could do better in uh, an honors class versus an academic. And I think that's the point I was trying to make. Ms. Fallon? Um, I think that my only concern about this proposal is that students have already registered for courses. The program of study is already out. If we change policy, I think they've got, you've got to expect there are going to be students who are like, oh, I would have taken the AP class had I known I didn't have to take the exam. Do you know what I'm saying? Who are going to be mad that they chose to balance their schedule more when now it would turn out that they have the opportunity that they could have taken, you know, four AP classes instead of just the two because either, you know, it would it was a financial decision or just a looking for balance in their schedules. And so I do worry about the timing of this. It seems strange that we would decide in late June to implement a change like this by September. And I feel like we've learned from past experience that maybe those sort of sudden changes don't always go as well as we'd hope. And so I didn't know if the plan was to start this September for the two-year pilot or if there was a way to implement it for the following year so that we could make sure that students and families knew that there was going to be a change in policy. Um, I, I don't feel super <coughs> strongly about it either way, but it, it is something that concerns me about changing the policy at this very second. Reactions? Or so, sure. The plan is to change it for the fall. The students who are there um, encourage that. We didn't hear anything from the teachers that that was a concern for them. I, again, they didn't have a ton of time to digest it, but nobody brought that up as a concern. I guess my sense is 
you're not taking anything away. Those students have made their choices, um, and you're basically opening and you're, you're making it more flexible for the students who have decided to take the AP. Um, I think it's pro I don't know how much people have talked to some of the high school students about this year. And I'm certainly happy to share, ask our high school rep if he wants to share if what happened and you know this was told to me recently I obviously had nothing to do with it but what happened with some of the students who were trying to say I don't want to take four AP exams over a three-day period I want to focus on one do you, do you want to say anything or I mean yeah as a I wasn't at any of these meetings I didn't work on the, the site or anything just an average student at the high school um, I've had conversations with all my AP teachers I've had t um, AP teachers that s teach the course specifically to the test, which is one style of doing it, and then I've had teachers that just teach the course as it is without prep specifically for the test, and I don't know if that's gonna be something to consider if you wanna change it to the AP and like the other alternative advanced honors or whatever it's called, because then teachers might change the style they teach. Um, I've had a lot of classmates that are not financially able to take all the APs they want, and I know from being their classmate for the past 12 years, that they are definitely academically available to do that. But um, the issue often comes down to cost. I'm a big fan of the AP test. Um, even if I, didn't have to pay, if I had to pay for it, if it was optional, I would still pay for it. I would still take the test. I think that's important um, to show my score against other scores across the country. And um, that's very valuable to me. Um, but I also know a lot of students don't find the value in that. I mean, honestly, um, next year I've signed up for AP Statistics. I don't know if I want to take the test because I don't know what that specific test is going to do for me personally after high school. Um, but I know a lot of students would like to take that. So I think it'd be interesting to explore the, the option of having the same level of difficulty without the test. Um, I do wonder um, if you develop more courses, that's more courses in the schedule, and if you're going to need teachers to drop other courses to accommodate the non-AP test, but same curriculum. Like, I, um, one of our English teachers teaches two APs, and would one of them have to be different? What if an, uh, more than enough students sign up for the non-AP? I don't know if that would eliminate, if not enough kids took the AP, if that would eliminate the class, if not enough kids signed up. Um, and that's something that I think is important because a lot of a lot of kids do take the AP classes. Yes. There's questions. Uh, I'd like to know: um, Would we still pay reduced and freight? Uh, right. The second one would be. Yeah. It's actually up to 200 percent of the poverty level. Yep. Mm -hmm. Would so in the two-year pilot that was the. Mm -hmm. No, that was, that's different. the policy yep. that we changed. So. Okay. Whether this motion Doesn't passes matter. or not, we're covering up to 200%. Okay. And the second is, uh, obviously, we'd have students would have to make a decision pretty early on in the year. They can't make the decision in um, March mm -hmm. because the exams are ordered. So mm -hmm. has that been discussed? And then the third question is, if it's a two-year pilot, what are the, what's the data we're looking at? Because I would think it would be, are we encouraging more students, in which case that first year would be not so great. I would worry about that. But what what are the things we're looking at in the two years? Dr. Can I just respond to that? This is one of the things that I think was a part of Dr. Cheever's proposal that um, was was felt to be, I guess, too much into the weeds um, for the committee to to uh, take up at the time. What I think is the most important measure is whether changing this requirement creates more access for students. One of the things that I think um, bothers me is that we've essentially eliminated the cost of the test as a barrier for low-income kids, but we don't have a lot of low-income kids participating in AP. So that um, the financial barrier of the test itself alone I don't think is the thing that's holding um, students out. Um, we also know that other other groups that are that there are groups that are traditionally underrepresented in anything that we think is good in school um, aren't in taking AP classes in the same numbers. We don't have enough students with disabilities. We don't have enough um, students of color. Um, all those we don't have enough high need students um, taking AP tests. If we were to do this, that would be the metric that I would strongly recommend should be the measure of success or failure. 
Yes. So, so I think those things are super important, but they should probably be a different discussion too, because I don't see that this pilot would necessarily address those issues. The question is why are those students not taking this exam? And we have relieved a lot of students of the burden of paying for it, as you said. So I think that's a really important question that we as a group should come back to and figure out how do we get those students taking it. But to use that as a measure of the success of this pilot program doesn't quite mesh for me because we're not doing anything in this pilot program necessarily to encourage more of those people to take the test. Um, what I see as the pilot program is um, I truly believe we're in this period um, where some of this you know, legality is going to come out over the next two years, okay? And I would hope to be able to, whoever's running the meeting and talking with the teachers, say, how did this affect your teaching of the course? What was your experience with it? What was bad about it? What turned out okay about it? And it, it's somewhat subjective, but I think we have a small enough school system that for me that would be, that would be fine. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm going to share something else I've heard that's going on at the high school because I don't know how well known this is. But um, our students were told this year that they had to, as every year, they have to take the AP. And I think some years students can talk their way out of it. And this year they couldn't because it became such an issue. And it was um, pretty firm. No, you have to pay for the AP. Or you're, and they were told they couldn't walk at graduation is what I've been told if they didn't pay for it. Please correct me if I say anything that you think um, is wrong. I'm not sure about the graduation comment. I mean, I wasn't graduating. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I do know that this year there was a lot of pressure that these students, if they took the class, they had to show up, like physically show up for the test. And I know that one of the tests, um, I think like 30 students were enrolled and only 15 showed up. And there was a lot of, a lot of angst about that, that all of these students and weren't showing up. Some of them were seniors, but a big chunk were juniors. And I think that there was some concern about the show the enrollment for that class um it might have been because that particular class was only offered in the fall and it touched in the spring and right. so students did not feel ready for it um but there was a lot of pressure from everywhere for the students to at least show up and put their name on the test yeah and so i think i bring that up just because i think this is a really big student issue right now and i just want to share that information so we had what what was shared with me was Students who had a couple tests back to back picked some of them. I, I don't want to make this into everybody, but there is a population of students that picked which test was most important to them, what they thought would help them the most in college, and they focused on studying for that and in some cases went to an AP test, put their name on it, knew they were going to get a zero. Some of the teachers said that's fine, um, and studied for their other test during that three hour period. So in a couple years, when we look and we see this year we have lower AP scores, I think you'll, that's a piece of it, and I'm just sharing that so people can interpret it properly down the road when you see that. But they've been doing that forever. I don't. I. It happened when my daughter was. Here. I, okay, Kids I wasn't were aware that they were doing their that. names and, and walking out. It's been going on forever. I mean, I'm just saying it's it's been a. We long still have time an 80 percent. Yeah. No, I, I understand. Yeah, I, it I just, might be a little lower. It could be. Yeah. Could be. I just want to ask uh, for the teachers, you know, Miss Hennessy, will you? I mean, will will people teach the class differently? Because I mean, there are going to be kids who are going to want to take the test, so I would yeah. hope that we're not going to change the way we I don't teach the class. Think anyone would teach the class? I mean, we don't know what the test is. Yeah. We know the topics, and we're teaching yeah. the standards. I, I can't imagine teaching it differently. The only thing I think it would have an impact on would be knowing in October or November who the students weren't taking it. Sometimes this thing called senioritis takes yeah. effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then we're, if you do, if your class does a lot of group projects, I mean, I think just thinking about who's being put together might have an impact but okay. other than that I don't think because would. I wouldn't want I mean that's my concern because I do worry about the kids who go to schools where they're going to get AP credit and that, that the yeah. families are doing that and, and so I wouldn't want them to get a different experience because the teacher was suddenly yeah. like oh you don't have to take the test I'm going to teach it right. differently I so hope I'm not that saying that our not, teachers yeah, wouldn't do that but I but it's the whole I just it would be a dynamic that would be different yeah. I think if you have 50 percent of your kids not taking it it, the kids would have a different dynamic. I don't True. think the teacher would teach them. Okay. Okay. Just curious. Yes. Um, uh, I think that because um, Amherst does this, I think that that's why I felt like we could try a pilot. I feel like we're pretty united in a lot of our sort of best practices with Amherst, and that um, it 
I would I would trust the teachers and the community of teachers to you know to reach out and research it and see how it's going. I mean, I could be wrong, but that was that was sort of again sort of part of why I was interested in doing a pilot because I we're seeing it in these different places that it's working. Down, you have a response uh, to yeah, that. Yeah, no, I just I'm just thinking in, in the nature of a pilot, and again, I'm just getting back to the teachers. Yeah. I'm wondering, could we get the teachers to represent to us yes or no, right? This is what our policy proposal is. Because again, we've talked about a lot of important considerations about whether we're actually reducing access, whether we, you know, are we, I, I think the thing that Ed said, maybe year, you know, year rotation of AP and then an equivalent course that's taught at the same level. Because we do have APs that rotate in and out. Um, you know, would that be, would that be an option? Um, so I think there are a lot of options. It's just rather than having the school committee design it from above, I'd really like to see what the teachers want to do from below. And in the nature of a pilot, you don't do pilots with the right. whole program, right? Pilot typically would be a few motivated AP instructors who think that it would make no difference <clears throat> or, in fact, improve their course. They could say, we want to pilot it. We, we, you know, we agree that we're going to adopt our curriculum and we're going to change our courses. And those courses, you could remove the fee and see what happens, see whether enrollment changes, see whether achievement changes, see whether test changes. And then at the end of the two years, if you go forward with this, you could compare those courses that have a fee versus those courses the test. that don't. We keep the test. 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 Yeah. Well, but I mean, the yeah. equip, it's a functional equipment, right? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, you know, the, the interesting issue of, about not walking. I mean, I, you know, generally if you haven't paid your fees for a textbook, but, um, I'd, I'd be really curious to see whether that was a rumor or whether that was true because, again, you know, when it comes to registration, the AP coordinator does spend a lot of time chasing down those people. Um, and so if they actually don't pay. So I, I guess I would just like to hear from the teachers before we go forward. If, if the teachers come back and say, this is great. And again, the issue of having, for me, the invited group that was specifically created to be an even cross-section versus random sample versus, I mean, Ken, you said a few meetings ago that if you can get the population, you get the population. And I think we have access for at least a few more days to all of our AP instructors. And, and we could just put to them, this is where we're about to go. You have, you know, three days to address this in writing and, and let us know whether you think this is a good proposal, bad proposal, in between. And then at our next meeting, we could say, oh, look, you know, nine out of ten you know doctors and then we could just go forward with it um, or if there was a real split of opinion maybe we could change the pilot and say let's go forward with those those instructors who feel like they can do this and again there might be other administrative reasons you wouldn't want to do that um, but again I, I just feel like as a school committee to make I mean you looking at the minutes you made a comment about how we should mandate whether you know whether a teacher gave a final exam or didn't give a final exam and again this seems to me a pretty uh, powerful intervention into how a teacher might structure a course. Um, and so if you, you, know, you, if you, you just announce them, yeah, the AP that you've designed your curriculum around, that you've pulled data from, it's just not going to happen for you. Um, and, and again, you know, it's, it's, uh, we have a lot of discussions about grouping kids and tracking kids. Um, and, you know, I think and we, we tend to go at those things relatively slowly and there's a lot of pushback so I think you know and that same same consideration should be given here before we go forward again I don't see um, and again Ms. Pesansky will like this I don't see that taking an extra month and allowing for the feedback um, allowing for a little more process around this would would affect it um, as Ms. Fallon said the kids schedules are already made up they can't very well change this I do think that's a significant consideration because they might have said, oh, I, I'm not going to take that many APs because it's a financial problem. And now you're going to say, oh, too bad for you because your schedule is already made up and you can't switch in. So uh, I mean, I'm mean, i going to vote against this tonight. Um, but that's not to say that I, that I think the AP program is, is the best it can be as, pro as currently constituted and that we can't make modifications that will make it better. Um, um, Ms. Kusansky. <coughs> So um, I think that we've had a pretty extent. Well, I guess actually, let me back up. I, I'm curious. Was uh, Principal Lombardi at the meeting? Yes. Okay. 
So I feel like um, he is the principal of the building, and it's up for to him to for us to get feedback from him in this process. I don't think it is up for us as the school committee to survey all the AP teachers. I think that'd be a really um, bizarre practice to try and employ in three and a half days before school ends to go try to figure out what AP teachers, every AP teacher is thinking through a survey. So, um, you know, I think we make lots of decisions through what you are calling hearsay. I don't call it hearsay. I call it our process. We get, we have subcommittees. That's how we run. Those subcommittees meet with different teachers, administrators. We get hearsay back from them. We have principals, other directors of other programs stand up and give us hearsay about what teachers think or how their building is going to be run. So to me, this really is a question if we're going to try to um, confer with anyone. I think it would be, um, you know, the principal of the high school, and we should ask him what he thinks his staff wants. That's his role, and that's our role in how we should be dealing with them. So um, I also think, I think in this whole discussion, maybe one thing that hasn't come up is, and what kind of moved me to the place of feeling like we should give this a try, this two-year pilot, is that, you know, we started, we got the MIMSI grant, what, 10 years ago. It paid for the AP test to be taken for five years. Before that, we did not require the AP test be taken. Is that right? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, that's my understanding. So to me, that's a pretty relatively new requirement in the length of our school. And so we had AP exams there. And also, just to add into this conversation, that AP test, um, students taking AP tests have um, risen dramatically statewide in this exact same period of time. So I don't think it's just the MIMSI grant that we got that, you know, caused APs to kind of increase, AP test takers to increase, but it's just another piece of it. So um, I think that's a relatively new amount of time. And so we've really only spent five years making kids pay for, or families pay for AP tests by themselves. And so to me, to go back or to change back is what I think we're really doing or saying is just not <laughs> that dramatic of a decision. But um, if we wanted to try to confer with the principal again before we made this final decision. I think that'd be okay. I think we could also ask him the question you raised, which I think is a really good one about like how he feels this will affect program of studies and students and is this too soon? And so maybe that's just one last little piece of due diligence that we need to do is to understand from the principal, but not um, go and survey teachers in the last three and a half days of school. I just, but I just want to be clear, we are still going to require people to pay for the test, like the kids who want to take the test yeah. and want to get the AP yeah. credit. Yes. So, I don't know. No, no. I think I could make a constitutional argument that if I'm a kid who wants to get AP credit, that I'm being denied an equal education because I have to pay, I'm paying money and you're not, and we're both getting the same credit on, on our, I mean, I'm sure I think a lawyer could make that argument that, that, there's, a, that there's an inequity there, so. Just but to be. It's an interesting. <laughs> possibility but go ahead just to be really clear on the motion I, I think it is appropriate to call the pilot and we were really careful we're changing one thing and I think that is important because you don't want to make a lot of changes the one thing the motion is saying is for two years don't require the test it, it if a teacher wants to say I'm going to give you an AP final exam in the class they can do that we're not telling them what to do right so if they so we're not requiring them to do the test that you pay for by the educational testing service. That's the only change for two years to see how that affects things. Just to be clear, that's why it's called a pilot. Yeah. I, yeah. I understand that. Yeah. I just want to, just don't want us to labor under the illusion that there aren't going to still be kids paying to take the test and maybe paying for four tests because they want to take the test because they their family can't afford, you know, college and so. So anyway, yeah. Can you, um, just for informational purposes, what, what is the actual dollar amount that if we were to pay for all the tests that are currently <coughs> taken? Within a few thousand of $65,000. It was between 60 and 65,000. I was gonna say 60, so yeah, somewhere in that vicinity. And if we did that, we might be paying for more, is what mm -hmm. everybody's saying, is they're saying they would take more tests if it was free. Well, that's the contention. I think there's different. I think there's different subsets here because there are mm -hmm. some students who want the AP credit, but don't want to have to take an exam their the spring of their senior year. I hear that's sort of what I hear a lot. Um, so it's true. It really is true. 
Um, there is definitely a subset of students who are going to go to school who are confident they're going to schools that won't take their AP credit, um, but they wanted the AP credit to get into those schools, and so they don't, you know, so that there's, there's lots of different um, catch 22s going on here. So, yes. I would be really responsible with that, making sure they make a decision by a certain time, because then we have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And if then they decide later, yeah. make this, the decision is made at this early stage. So, there should be a time to, to declare. Because then you can't say, oh, you know what, I don't want to. They That's should pay that. then. They should have to pay then. Yeah. One of the things that came up mostly from students was that there seems to be a lot of confusion about um, whether the whether the how much the fee is, how much they're going to have to pay, and what the value of taking the exam is and getting potentially college credit or grants or what have you. So there was this underlining sort of sense, and the students were pretty adamant about that a number of times. I think even when they presented to us, is that we it would be who of us to beef up the guidance of really articulating for kids early on what their options are. The, um, but what I want to say, and the reason I disagree with Donnie's uh, premise or idea to talk to teachers, I think first of all, there, there is a survey of AP teachers that um, the student council did, so you can access that for a number of questions that were posed to all the AP teachers. Um, so that's in case you forgot, that's available. Oh, I didn't forget. Okay. So um, I think that there's something, <laughs> there's something really important to be engaged in a discussion to be part of, the, of a conversation. I think the teachers who uh, showed up at the meeting gained something a lot more um, than a teacher getting something and asked to answer a survey question. And my example of that is this, and I come back to what Ann had said, which is um, she's absolutely right. This is about the fee. I think the students talked about that, the, the parents talked about that, and that was a lot of our discussion. Um, and the other thing is the value that Ann talked about as an instructor was the value that the teachers talked about. And so as we're talking this discussion, I'm still struck with why wouldn't we change this? Why wouldn't we change given that this is what the students overwhelmingly want? This is what I think, unless you all have received notices from parents that I haven't, this is what the parents overwhelmingly want. And at the meeting, although you know we had a variety of folks, I was searching for an answer as to what's the value of keeping this in place. And what Ann had said was what the teachers had said. And they said that early on, that there's a real value in looking at how these kids did. It's my opportunity to reflect on the quality of my teaching, gives kids an opportunity to see, compare themselves to others and teachers with others. Clearly, by the end of the discussion, particularly when there was a, where there was a strategy in place to have um, kids, all kids take the exam, just some would take the AP exam and some would take potentially an older AP exam, the students, the, the teachers really seem to buy into that as an opportunity the notion of what they could lose by um, the assessment itself, by getting that assessment scores, they really seem to be compromising because they, they had mixed feelings on this to begin with. In fact, it was the teachers who said to the, it was the kids, the students who said to the teachers, are you sure you wanna take this on? Are you sure you wanna grade all these AP exams? That's gonna take a lot of your time. So, I mean, it was like the kids who were like protecting their teachers who were offering this as an, as an alternative. But after all this conversation, I'm still struck with why aren't we doing this? I mean, everybody, all the, almost all the teachers, the students we've heard from, the parents we've heard from, and uh, my take was there was a lot of satisfaction with the outcome that we achieved, which is to test something out, whether you want to call it a pilot or not. I like the idea that what we're saying is we're going to revisit this and that we're gonna look for a data and we're gonna to look to see whether it worked or not. It's not a practice that uh, in and of itself is gonna change forever, that we're, we're almost saying, let's check into it two years from now. So all the pieces seem to fit. I'm not, I'm not sure why we're, who we're arguing with at this point, honestly. It just seems like there's, a, there's an overwhelming amount of support for this and if we go and search out other people who have other ideas, that's fine, but this is not new. This is something that the, the students presented months ago to us uh, we've had a lot of time to do it. We struggled to get a time for the curriculum subcommittee. I do wish we had met earlier. I agree with uh, Lauren that you know this seems a little late in the game, but it is what it is, and it doesn't seem like a. It doesn't seem like uh, I'm still wondering why we're not. Did, what's what's the counterpoint outside of just? I don't know what the counterpoint is. We haven't heard enough from the community to dissuade us from this. I don't. Th I don't see the need to come up with with ideas that other people haven't raised to us, and it hasn't been addressed already in a very appropriate professional manner. So, any um, 
Any other questions or thoughts? There was a motion uh, that the committee put forward that was seconded. Um, did I, you had asked um, about doc, about Mr. Um, Lombardi. Did he, was he, he was at the meeting, so did he support the motion? He didn't not support it. Does that mean? Okay. I'd okay. I just was curious because you because he was you you said that he should be speaking, and I just was curious if someone asked him to to speak for on behalf of the teachers. My my impression that Mr. Lombardi just wanted a clear directive so that he didn't have to so that he could tell all of his parents this is what the school committee said, you know, and I I have no discretion here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> for people that were trying to get waivers That's right. for the test. That's right. I said, okay. tell me tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. Okay. So, so I, I think he was definitely part of the process, sitting okay. in the room, making the motion, and if he didn't feel comfortable with it, I would hope he would have put his hand up. He certainly participated in the conversation, mm -hmm. and from his not reacting in a negative, you know, not making changes to it, I would take away that he supported it. But I don't recall him saying, yes, I support that. But mm -hmm. there was every opportunity for him to contribute, and he contributed throughout the, the entire meeting quite a lot. Okay. Um, and does the superintendent have a recommendation or a thought on this matter? Yeah, I, I, I keep coming back to um, what I think is the bigger issue here, which is we are we're running a program that consumes a great deal of resources that has, at least on the, a, a facial level, problems of equity. Um, the, the, the financial piece is, is a serious consideration, but when you think through where we go with the idea of possibly paying for all students, it's true that the, the teachers and everyone in the room said, well, $65,000 would be better spent on a teacher, but then we're talking about, well, let's say that wasn't a problem. Then we're talking about taking a program that seems to be inequitable on its face and pumping more money in to subsidize <coughs> groups that are not in the the marginalized groups of our schools. So that that's problematic to me. Um, I get, you know, I get to where I mean, I, I go back to where I started that discussion. I wonder if the whole AP program has just become too large to be sustainable. You know, we've got 650 tests being taken at the school, which is much larger than than schools of comparable size. Um, for example, last district I came from, the school is a quarter bigger, um, so they're doing they're doing classes of about 275, 300, and they're taking, you know, about 300 tests, about half as much as us. So I think there may be some AP craziness. Um, I think if the goal is to give all students access to a higher level academic experience, maybe we need to start thinking about whether AP is even sustainable. Um, that's, that's really where I started. That's where I still am. I wonder if dual enrollment or some other kind of option might be better because I think we're going to keep coming up against this problem. We may take the money problem off, but then we get to your problem. You know, you have the inequity between the families who say we'll pay and the ones who say we won't pay. Um, I just think that it it may be a process that has gone through an explosive um, growth and is now really difficult to sustain. One of the things that was part of the discussion that hasn't come up that I'll um, just throw out there is even if you um, set aside all the money um, discussions regarding students in the test, one of the um, issues that Mr. Lombardi brought up, and he did say that he would like some relief from, is that just paying proctors for the test is putting them in the hole. Um, and so he did ask for some support for that. And so then, you know, like, again, I ask, okay, so is proctoring the test the best use of our resources? So, you know, I think the whole thing has left me thinking that, you know, that was not the question put to the subcommittee, but the question that the superintendent has is, is it time for us to start looking for a transition to something besides AP? Okay. Just, just to follow up on that, I think that to me speaks for this two-year pilot along the lines of at your previous school if you had three eight, 300 AP tests offered was it was it required did everybody have to take it no. so I think that's a really big difference so we can't compare those 300 to our 600 because at our school 
everybody's required to take it. And what, if this was lifted, what we might find out after the pilot is now we're offering 400. And I, my prediction would be the <coughs> scores would go up, the kids would be happier. I think they'd take the classes seriously because they still want to get a good grade in them. I mean, it, these are kids who are trying to learn the material. And um, you would need less proctors. So in terms of a transition, ha clearly what came out in the forum, the students ran with the parents, more discussions needed. But as you said, this was the issue sent to the subcommittee. And I agree with Mr. Kaufman. I mean, the more we talk about it, I don't think it's such a big loss for two years to see if it helps with some of these problems. And it's what I'm hearing from everybody that they want. Um, I do think most of the kids are still going to take the test. Can we have the student have the last word or just give us his thoughts? Just um, in response to the AP crazy comment, I mean, 300, 600, I feel like is a large jump. You know, being in a school of about 1,000 kids, my class being about 200, that's a lot of students. And um, one thing I've noticed is that, especially in my grade, um, my class, is that a lot of kids are in the exam. Um, a lot of my friends were in the AP English first semester. The class was 20 to 30 kids. So when I saw I had it second semester, I was like, oh, for sure, I'm going to have a small class. And then I show up, and it's 30 kids. And the period before me is also 30 kids. And I feel like there definitely is, I don't know if this is a Northampton thing or just my grade or what, but there definitely is a large portion of kids that are taking the AP classes, and then they're the ones that say they don't want to pay for the test. Um, and another thing I just want to bring up about scheduling, um, I don't know how quickly, realistically, any changes can be made, um, but since I've come to the high school, the possibility of switching out of classes has become increasingly stricter. It went from you can change classes at the beginning of the year within, within a certain like two weeks or whatever, um, and then it went to you're not allowed to drop AP or honors class. I'm assuming, especially if the AP was to pay for the test so we knew how many tests to order and stuff. Uh, but now this year it's, it's gotten even stricter in that um, you needed to fill out this form you know, within a couple days of signing up for the classes. And um, when I saw that I had two APs back to back periods, I was a little anxious. I've never taken an AP before and now I have two that I have to worry about in the same semester. I didn't know when they were going to be. Um, some of them are only offered first or second semester, and I think that might be something to consider is that a lot of students will want to take the courses, might want to take up the four APs, but if all four are in the first semester, they might be like, no, I don't want to take these two because I don't want to drown myself in work mm -hmm. for a semester. And so I don't know if that's something you might want to change with the ability to drop or change courses mm -hmm. because I've had some, like a first semester that was much, much easier than a second semester, mm -hmm. and I think for it to be evenly challenge would be beneficial to students on many levels. Okay. Any other comments, questions, motions, amendments? I just, I just want to one students. more time say if everybody feels comfortable with pushing this through that quickly and, and, and asking this change to happen, like with the scheduling issues and, I mean, is this going to cause an uproar at the high school? If we make this policy change tonight and all these students say, well, I would have taken it. I just, I just want to be aware of the potential burden we're placing on the administration when you've got students who may be clamoring to change courses now based on a policy change just a few months before they start in oh. September. That's all. I, I have no concept of how it works. What do you so. think, Michael, about that? Do you think kids really were? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> yes. He's here. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm glad you asked. But I mean, there's been, a, <laughs> yeah. there's been a lot of discussion about this topic all year. So it's not like it, well, it came out of left field. I mean, it is something that we've been actively discussing. I'm just curious what you think, how that would affect behavior. I think, to take the fifth. I think that there are going to be a lot of students that would be upset that now they're being told at you know the final couple days of school year that they could have had an opportunity to take a higher level course without the burden of taking the exam. Especially for some classes that we only offer in AP, like AP Psych, I know it's only offered every other year, but only the AP option. AP Microeconomics is only the AP option, and a lot of kids don't want that extra burden of worrying about the test in the spring, especially going into senior year. So I feel like a lot of, specifically my classmates, would not be happy with, oh, I had the opportunity to do that for my final year, and then not be able to do anything about it. 
think I'll sue. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one or two others. Um, again, you know, unintended consequences. Um, okay, wow. This is challenging. This is challenging. I'll say, I don't know, you know, now, I mean, we were, we were set with a charge, and I think that we worked really hard and brought something forward, which was also what we wanted to do. And I know that, for example, Rules and Policy works really hard, and they, you know, try to get things right, and they bring stuff here, and then we talk about it, and it and it can uh, mix things up. But suddenly, we've introduced other things, which is um, concepts around, like, are the, you know, are there other honor? I mean, you brought up this thing of like, could you have more honors classes instead of an AP class? And Mikey's brought <coughs> up that only this one AP class is offered. Could we not? offer an honors class. I mean, it does, like we're cracking a really huge egg. Um, and I think that we were charged with something and I was looking at it in, you know, one small piece with the piece that, with this information of the fee to the test. Um, I feel like a lot of the questions are things that the high school com teachers and the administrators need to talk about because it's their you know it's their school with the data that you're that you're talking about and if you'll um, you know I wonder if in if we put forward this pilot that that is the as soon as and said is the opportunity to try to play with you know try to think about these things in other ways. Um, which I guess is why I also feel like I'm kind of intrigued by this idea because um, because so often we equate a test to some you know to to something and I guess I'm sort of interested I mean there was a study that came out from a very good institute and I should send it to you all about SAT scores and you know how do we how you know we're I don't know I feel like we're at this opportunity to sort of break down some of these um, Hi, you know, some of these forms that are kind of set, some of these traditional things. So, um, and I feel like this gives us an opportunity to look at how we could offer things alternative to AP that would be engaging and, and curiosity building and, and engage more students. Um, but I don't know how we do, I don't know how we move that forward. I don't know how we move that forward. So we were given the charge to put this on the table. And Principal Lombardi was clear about the timeline that you guys were planning on. It, but if this went through, that this would go through the quickly? Because that's all. I support the, the idea of the pilot. It's the timing of it that I don't want to have everyone put so in the awkward position. When I making. first, all of us, I needed help. I did not form the motion on my own at all. I don't want to take credit, right? We put it together, and it was either a teacher or a student who said, oh, you need to put the year when it starts. And I don't remember exactly who contributed to that conversation, but it came from not the three of us. And everyone, nobody spoke up. It seemed like they all wanted it to start right away. Um. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, yes. But we could put forward a motion to um, postpone this for a month and check in and see, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't to check in on the timeline. Like, should we, put, should we put this forward for a year off or starting in September? I so don't think that that's a... We could. I mean, where I'm at is um, this is not new. We've been talking with the students about this for the better part of the year. A lot of us went to the forum. Um, we had this, I thought, pretty good, intense meeting with the teachers. Um, frankly, I kind of feel like the pilot isn't really that big a change. I know it, it's a change. I don't want to take that away. But there's things about the AP that aren't really working perfectly. And I've heard from so many constituents and so many students. And as an educator myself, I haven't talked about that. I advise 20 students every year. They come in. Most of them have taken an AP class. And a lot of them have never taken the AP test. So this is not, this is more standard, that model, than what we do. And, um, you know, I'm just kind of ready to try something and look at <coughs> people that are being affected by it, and that's where I'm at. But 
people okay. want to put it off, we'll put it off. Dr. Prowess? I just wanted to speak to Laura's question. And, um, please take this with a, a huge grain of salt because I'm interpreting. Um, but when Brian made his comment about, please just tell me what the rule is, um, to me, administrator to administrator, that meant I want a very clear rule so that if there are complaints, I can say, I gave you the right information at the time I published the book. Now I'm giving you the right information that the school committee has changed. You can't come to me and complain. When you say the book, you mean the course? The book. course of studies, yeah. Oh, okay. And the course of studies said you had to take the test? Yes. Okay. Okay. I mean, would, that, would we expect that if we were to vote on this tonight for starting in September that there would be a very quick sort of outreach to make students and families aware of the change? What would you say? You would say that, that AP the option and that it take? be decided by a certain <laughs> date whether their students saying. were taking yeah. the exam or not, yeah. and that if they said they were, that they were responsible for that fee so that the school district wasn't eating it. I'm just saying all of that information needs to get out, I think, to families pretty quickly then about the change in policy so that you don't have students that say, oh, yeah, I'll take the exam and then try to change their mind at the end saying, well, it's not required and we've already bought the exams. I, like, I, I don't know how we enforce that if we do it under the same student fees, fines, and policy. Um, but I just, that, those are all, like, these things all need to happen and I think we need to make sure people are aware of it. That's a big complaint. People didn't know that there were fees and that they were responsible for taking for paying for AP exams in the first place, now we need to make sure we do outreach to say, well, actually, you have this option. So I just, yeah, I, it's just the practical details of it. It's not the, the idea as a whole that I'm struggling with. Do other, did the other districts you looked at, did they have like a date that you had to like declare? I don't see it. But like I wonder like what Amherst but does, for example. Right now, all these students think they have to pay, so. It's not like we're telling them they have to pay more. It's just we need to be organized and they need to. Well, they to still have to pay if they want to take the test. Right. So exactly. So keep mixing that up. Like, there are still going to be students that, who want to take the test. That's and they're right. still going to have to pay. That's right. So okay. that's not changing. That's right. Exactly. So we have a system. All students yeah. are used to having to pay for a certain test and having to decide by a certain date. And yeah. they just even go directly right. into the mm -hmm. AP College Board site and mm -hmm. pay for it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I just wasn't, I just think it would be good because you wouldn't want to let kids mm -hmm. opt out in like the well, final week of the, right. of the right. class. I don't think this is going to be a good test for me, so I'm not going to take it now. So you'd have to, logistically, you'd have to have that figured out. But, so I don't know. Does that have to be a policy or can that be a procedure? I think it's how they would carry out the policy. Well, I just meant because if we have to write a new policy and get it approved, so we couldn't even do that. So you think it could just be a procedure or a practice? I don't think it would be a, a formal policy in terms of something that's coded to the book. I think this is one of the policies that's um, found in another document right now. The policy is embedded in the course of studies where it says that all students who enroll in AP courses must take the AP test. So it would just be changing this, the course, so of, changing studies. The course of studies. And we would have to vote on that officially. So we'd have July and August, we'd just get it in under the law. It would, it would probably be an addendum to the course of studies. But will we still have to vote on that? Or but I mean, this vote, doesn't this, this vote, vote effectively change the course of studies? So that's what I'm asking. Oh, yeah. It could, yeah, I mean, it could be, to clarify, that could be added as an yeah. amendment. Someone, I mean, to get caught up in the details, but I feel like they're sometimes important. They are, actually. So, so you, would, you would do it as an addendum to tonight's vote? It would be an addendum to the course of studies. I think you'd want to amend tonight's vote to just clarify that you were, your intent was to change the course of studies, just so you wouldn't have to come back and have a second vote. Yeah. Just to add, right now, if your kid's taking an AP exam, you get a thing sent home that says, please send us a check by such and such a date. And I don't know the date of when they sign them up, but you're billed for it. And I think it would be the very similar process, but it would say, if your child wants to take the test, send a check by such and such a date. And maybe it would be moved up a little, but I think they have a way to do this. But don't you think they're very clear? Don't you think there should be a little expectation that parents may want you to now weigh in with, they may need to speak with guidance to the teacher as far as, like, my kid's not sure, it's their first AP class. What would be the benefit of taking it versus not taking it? So I think we need to be prepared that we should probably do a little education around the options. And Like, I think that we're assuming that all parents understand the AP process. And I don't have any kids who have gotten to that level yet. And, and I'm on the school committee, and I think I would really want to hear from a trusted advisor what the advantages and disadvantages of 
of those options are. So I, that's I'm just saying, like I, I want to make sure when we vote on this that we've got time and we've got we've thought of all of the things that really should happen to make this rollout smooth. I'm sorry, I'm going to piggyback on that. As Laura is talking, I'm thinking about just the administration or the you know the guidance, like who who does all of these things, and it's June and who's in the building and. I don't know all of those things to make every question that you've just asked happen. Yeah, I don't know the answers. <laughs> That's the problem. Yes, yeah. Ms. Busan. Yes, after learning that, you know, the principal Lombardi was at the subcommittee meeting, that he didn't say no, what, you know, Dr. Provost has shared with us, I feel pretty confident that uh, Principal Lombardi would have stood up, would have said something if he thought he could not implement this in time. And I, so I don't feel like that's the hang up. I feel like if we're if we should vote on this motion and uh, people, agree, <laughs> member will say how they want to vote. But I don't. I think that's for the school itself. They have to do education around the APs. Why should your kid take an AP versus not taking an AP test in general? And what does an AP test mean? I, I, and I just think it's just way too deep in the weeds for us to get into as a committee. For us to worry about that's again was I think Principal Lombardi the. Um, subcommittee meeting happened. He could have said something afterwards. It, it, it could have come up in many ways if it wasn't going to be possible to implement this for this upcoming school committee, for this up upcoming school year. So. Okay. But there is still the question of we are effectively amending the program of study, so you may want to mention it somewhere in the motion. Sure. Just so that there isn't, I mean, do we actually, we don't, do we actually approve the program of studies? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess we do vote on it. So we did vote on a program of studies that included this. So mm -hmm. even just some kind of a mm -hmm. disclaimer that the effect of this will is to, you know. Or just vote. say as, as it, and it will be reflected in the program of studies yeah. or something. Whatever. Just somehow mention that in there so that we don't have to come back and, not that I, this hasn't been a wonderful conversation, but I just don't want to have it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you want me to read? Ms. Walczak. I'm really not sure I want to jump into this. <laughs> but what I don't think I heard addressed was the question that Michael brought up. You're talking about changing the program of studies that says kids that are signed up for AP will now have a choice of taking the exam or not. I don't know how we open up a schedule to allow all the kids who did not sign up for the class because they didn't want to take the exam to now change their program you know, they're scheduled for next year to say, okay, now I want to take the AP and not take the exam, and now I'm going to drop out of other classes. That's that's a whole scheduling piece. I don't think I've heard talked about really. It's not happening. Right. It won't happen. Which gets back to the point of then there'll, there'll be students who would have taken the AP exam if they'd known. The AP test. I mean, would have taken yes. the class if they'd known they didn't take the exam. We're not going to be giving them any options for we next year. We won't know the full effect of this policy until next year, even if it goes into effect this year. Right because of that so I think you're right and sitting here thinking about that I think you're gonna have some students upset about that potentially and if we don't change it you're gonna have a different group of students that we've heard from upset about having to pay for the exam and um, it's kind of you know it just is a situation there's maybe not a perfect response it, I don't know if it's possible to open up registration it probably isn't for most of them I don't know maybe there's a few empty seats I, my experience is if there's an empty seat at guidance would help you figure it out in the summer but I don't know how it works now okay okay so um could, the, could no, we then <laughs> sorry so <laughs> Howard and I, I clearly get to the just had the part, same thought at the same time of because you guys are the science math people, does this invalidate a pilot study because you won't know what the effect of this change has because people weren't given the option to choose to enroll or not or because you've decided to just look at so, teacher satisfaction and how to, it's, <coughs> it's two years. So you'll get some data and you'll look at the data after two years and you'll say, what is the response of the teachers? How did it affect their classroom? What is the respect? the effect on the community and you'll have perhaps different registrations for the two years but I think you have that kind of difference in classes year to year too I, I it, it's not it's not we're not setting up a study we're doing a pilot to change one thing to try to accommodate a lot of feedback we got where people are having trouble with the current situation nothing's perfect right 
Okay, so um, would you be open to just- Would you like me to read an amended motion? Yeah, that might be helpful just- Yeah. Does anybody want to add anything to this? Um, okay. I mean, you could even just preface the, um, you could just put a preparatory statement mm -hmm. that says, as an amendment to the program of studies, Great. comma, and then your Great. motion or something. Okay. Or, or, or something as a as her, a her motion's on the table, so she could just offer an amendment to her own. Yeah, motion. she could. Yeah, without rereading the motion. It's, 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 yeah. Okay, so so it's it's only a few it's sentences. Policy. As an amendment to the to the current Northampton High School program of studies, all AP exams and actually maybe you should just say as a revision. Okay. To it because it's not really yep. a parliamentary. It's a yep. as a revision or. Or an update, or something like that, a revision. Yeah. Sorry for amending on the fly there. <laughs> You're a fly amender. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> As a revision to the Northampton High School program of studies, all AP exams administered by the ETS will be optional beginning with the 2018 to 2019 academic year for a two year pilot period during which all NHS transcripts will continue to use an AP designation. This pilot program will be revisited by the school committee at the end of the two year period in consultation with administrators and AP teachers. Okay, and the seconder of the motion is still fine with this. The Second. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay. So I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll on this one just because it feels like one of those ones we should have a roll call on. Mm -hmm. Mr. Becky Buzanski? Yes. Ms. Laura Fallon? Yes. Ms. Ann Hennison? Yes. yes. Mr. Lonnie Kaufman? Yes. Mr. Downey Meyer? No. Mr. Howard Moore? Yes. Ms. Susan Voss? Yes. Mr. Edward Zanowski? No. Ms. Molly Byrne? Yes. Mayor Dean Parker? Uh, no. Excellent. Thank you to everyone for the great debate on this, and thank you to the committee for your work on it. Um, is that is there any other report from this, uh, from your curriculum committee tonight? Any other? That was it. We're okay. done. Fine. That was perfect. Okay. Um, the, yes? I see that two people are waiting their one agenda down. Okay. Do you think that we could move sure. so that the principal of JFK could? Sure. Um, that would be the gift. Uh, I'm not, no, yeah. I'm not Isn't sure. Isn't it refer JFK? Refer JFK a la carte. Is that what they're there for? Apparently. Is that what you guys are here for? Um, I'm just, just hanging out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Never <laughs> <laughs> Sleeping over here. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Okay. <laughs> She's happy. Okay, fine, because I wasn't sure what yeah. it was. Okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda is a uh, vote to approve an MOA on therapy assistant summer pay. Dr. Provost? At a prior meeting, the school committee authorized me to enter it, um, or to draft this MOA to um, increase the pay of summer therapy assistants to um, reflect the same rate of pay that's given to speech pathology assistance in the summer. Um, so this language has been reviewed by our attorney and by NACE, and NACE is amenable to it if the committee approves. Okay. Is there a motion to approve that? Motion to approve a MOA on therapy assistant summer pay. Second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, next we have a, uh, a, a recommendation to refer uh, the JFK a la carte food sales uh, program to the budget and property subcommittee. Uh, and did you want to speak to this? Yes, um, just because this is a issue that has um, generated some public comment both <coughs> by email and through the media. It is a um, issue that has some significant potential impacts on either the school budget or the price of school lunches. And so I think that um, what would be best for the school committee is if they can see some different models and different options rather than just a yes or no vote um, in terms of 
different snacks that are on sale at the middle school at this time. So my thought is that it would make sense to refer this issue to budget and property where the food service manager could um, present different models and what their potential impacts could be, explore those in the subcommittee, and then come back to the school committee with some different options. Okay. Um, is, there a, is there a motion on that so we can? Sure. <laughs> Um, to refer. Yeah. <laughs> Just again, I'm doing some tootling here. So, <laughs> um, yeah, um, make a motion to move to refer to JFK a la carte food sales to the budget and property subcommittee for further discussion. Okay. I'll second that. Second. Any discussion on the motion? All in. I would. Oh. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, so I just have one statement to make. Um, yesterday I was contacted by a member of this committee who was concerned that I might have a conflict of interest regarding the JFK Middle School a la carte food discussion. And if it does come to subcommittee, I also am the chair of the Budget and Property subcommi uh, Subcommittee. Simply because my wife works closely with the Food Service Director. Um, in response, I contacted the State Ethics Commission today. Assist Assistant General Counsel Larrabee issued a written opinion that there is no conflict uh, because my wife has no financial interest in whether or not certain foods are sold in the cafeteria. However, to avoid any appearance of a conflict, I am publicly disclosing that my wife, in fact, does work as a secretary for the Food Services Director. Um, also, I want to let you know that I did um, file a, a disclosure uh, today of Form 23B with the city clerk, and that's on file. Um, so I wanted to make that public statement this evening. Okay. Ms. Hennessy. So I know you, you were very clear, Dr. Provost, about um, how it affects the budget. It, it feels to me too not, not in our purview. So I'd like a little bit more clarity. I feel like this is really micromanaging in terms of what's being sold at JFK. And I know that there's an issue with this, and I'm on one side of it, but I still wonder, are we venturing into a place that we shouldn't be in? I think possibly. Um, the, the school committee has never exercised anything like a line item um, approval or veto of the menus in the school. Um, uh, this issue was placed on the agenda because several committee members felt that they wanted to um, weigh in on this. But I, I do think that does raise that question. It would be a new precedent, I think, for the, the committee. I think the last thing the committee took up, which I think was different, was the whole issue of um, lunch shaming and what options would be av available to students who didn't were not able to pay for their lunch, which I think is different. Yes. Um, so I might fall on the opposite end of the spectrum. <laughs> um, so I was going to ask if it would be appropriate to refer this um, to the policy subcommittee. And we've had examples where issues get referred to two subcommittees at once. And the reason is I'm not that familiar with it, but we have um, a wellness policy. And I think it's really relevant. And it might provide an opportunity to have the, the other piece of this conversation. So there's one, the budget and how do we pay for our students' food. And then there's this other issue of wellness and what kind of food are we providing these students. And um, when I was out knocking on doors in the fall, this was actually one of the top questions people asked me. They asked me about the lunch in the, I have three names written down of people who want to make it um, reflective of our community and all the really good produce in the area. And not to say that it goes there, but I think there is a lot of community concern about what kids are eating. And specific to the JFK a la carte, I've had people share with me, you know, you put a lot of sugar in kids at certain times and they go in the classroom and it affects, we talk about the high needs future and we know that feeding kids a lot of sugar results in behavior, contributes to attention and behavioral problems. And I just think that this is something our policy committee could potentially look at deeper and see where where we fit in that. Yes. I was just going to say, um, it's one of the policies that we haven't updated in a while, although I think that what the policy does is refers back to those, the laws and regulations that govern it, which is, of course, those are the same that Mr. Trimbaglia has to follow. And so I don't, that that's, 
I, I would appreciate like a specific charge rather than just take a look at the wellness policy because you know it, it it's not necessarily a mission statement um, so just following up on dr. Voss's comments um, you're right we do have a policy that creates a wellness committee and I think going back to my original point that might be the place to address this um, it, it would not really necessarily have to involve the school committee at all. In fact, the um, place where we've tried to direct parents who want to have um, more discussion about the lunch options is to the wellness committee, which is offered to meet with any parent who wants to to discuss this issue. Um, Mr. Kaufman and then Mr. Meyer. Okay, thank you. So I'm looking at this, maybe, maybe I'm confused. I didn't really think of this notion to bring to the um, budget and property as an issue that's specifically related to a la carte foods. You, you and I have gone back and forth with this via email, Dr. Provost, so please correct me if my understanding is wrong, but my um, understanding was that the notion to move in this direction was uh, an attempt to um, make up for a budget deficit. Is that the gist of it? Yeah, I mean, just to maybe put, give a little more information <coughs> about that. As you know, the, the school committee is subsidizing the lunch program in two ways. Yeah. One is the roughly $40,000, I think it might be $36,000 this year, that's going to a structural operating deficit. Um, and then there's the bad debt. Um, this really addresses the first issue. Um, because really, your lunch program should be like a city's enterprise fund. It should be self-sustaining. You shouldn't be um, putting money into it. The fact that you're putting money into it means that it's not really sustainable as it is now. And that has to do with participation. And so one of the um, efforts that Mr. Tranfagli has been making is to increase sales and increase participation. That's been one of the things that's been able to sort of stabilize that piece um, to a certain extent. Uh, it does make the other part um, anything you do, so I just want to talk about the other side of it. Um, it also helps with the bad debt because this program is in essence allowing us to maintain a lower cost of the lunch. If we weren't able to sell a la carte, we would likely have to raise the cost of lunch for everyone, which would mean the bad debt would accumulate faster for people who are doing bad debt. So it, it helps in those two ways. Yeah. I mean, I guess I just see it as a, as a overall, it's a budget issue. It's an attempt to balance the budget in, in a healthy way, <laughs> air quotes. Um, so wouldn't it be beneficial to have a subcommittee look at the different options to, to make the food service system self-sufficient and to also simultaneously look at some of the deficits that we're dealing with and maybe just revisit what some other schools are doing, relook at some of the uh, practices that might be effective out there, and then and consider one of the options, one of the options that we currently have in place. But doesn't it make sense to kind of have a, a broader sort of holistic way of having a group of three people and whoever they invite look at a number of different solutions and then have us as a committee look at what makes the most sense into this next year, particularly since it's a budget issue? Doesn't that fall under our stuff? I mean, I, well, I mean to discuss what we should, I'm to, sorry, I mean, to discuss what we should serve does I seem hyper but. I thought that was what the motion was. Right. Well, then maybe it's about refer JFK a la carte food sales. Maybe that's not the solution. Maybe maybe there's another solution. I, I think it was just that was that was the flashpoint that this so that we were just referring that issue but I thought what I heard the Dr. Brogan say was that he was going to have Mr. Tremfagler come in and talk about different options. Okay well then when Mr. Tennessee's response was about doesn't this seem like we're micromanaging that threw me off like maybe there's is there a consistent understanding maybe I can ask uh, the, is it are, Rebecca are you the chair? No, as the chair of budget and property. What do you want me to hear from me? <laughs> what do you see as your chart? <laughs> well, absolutely. Well, I mean, so I'd be looking to have uh, Mr. Tranfaglia come and talk to us about the sustainability of this program. I think we heard from Dr. Provost that, you know, with $36,000 plus or minus coming in from our, our budget to supplement food service, how we could lower that number over years in order to bring those dollars back and get them into the classroom and not into the lunchroom would be something that I would be looking to hear from um, Mr. Trinfaglia and some of those creative ways and what that would look like. 
Now, if that includes um, increasing participation by polling kids and seeing what they would like to purchase, therefore resulting in more sales and more profit, then I think that's what I would want to hear from him. Um, I know there's a concern about healthy food versus what's being labeled as junk food. Um, it's my understanding that there's plenty of good food being offered on a daily basis, whether it's fruit or vegetable sticks or whatever. And then the other items that have been recently brought in meet the USDA um, standard for what, what should be offered for, for students snack or whatever it might be. So um, there's a few different things there, I think, that need to be discussed. But um, from the budget and property standpoint, my conversation would want to be around how the food service department can become more sustainable and not so reliant on, on the amount of money that we as a school committee would vote to send his way. OK, thank you. That's great. Mr. Meyer, and then so I'm just going to speak against the referral. I understand that referrals are sometimes important ways to gain information and, and maybe you increase efficiency. But I think as we've just seen, there's an issue with referring something to a subcommittee that we are fairly certain is going to become or there's a high likelihood there's going to be an action taken on it by the full committee. So it just doesn't seem to me in the fact that we've had a diversity of opinions expressed just on the referral motion itself that we wouldn't want to have Mr. Infanfaglia I apologize for, we're, you're already here at the so late, you know, we'll, we'll put you first on the agenda <laughs> that night. Um, but, but just that it wouldn't make more sense that if, that if he is going to give that presentation, why not give the presentation to the full committee? Again, why, why create a situation where we're going to rely on our recollections and reporting from the subcommittee and potentially when we make our decision at full committee not have the person who can provide us with that information present? Um, also, even more importantly, um, subcommittee meetings are incredibly difficult for committee members to make because often they're during hours that are very close to work. So if, again, if we know, and I think we do know, that there are some members of the community who are very invested in the outcome of our decision on this matter, why wouldn't we afford them the opportunity to be here and witness our discussion and even to participate in a recorded public comment so that they can, they can uh, have their views heard not just by people at a subcommittee meeting but by the entire community? So I, I, would, I would say, in this instance, even though there are sometimes reasons to refer, I would vote against referral. I would say, leave it here in the full school committee and go forward with it at full school committee. Ms. Fallon and then Ms. Pisansky. Um, I was going to say, I do agree with Mr. Meyer. And I also want to say that what um, Ms. Hennessy was saying about whether it's our purview, in our wellness policy, it very clearly states that the school principals, the health advisory committee, the food services director, and the school councils will participate in the monitoring of the wellness policy by reviewing nutrition and physical activity programs in the school, and that they will report to the superintendent. And so I do wonder where our place as the school committee is in that portion of the discussion. I'm, obviously, we can update our wellness policy. It's from 2006, but our own policy kind of takes us out of that, that discussion and puts it in the hands of principals, food services, school councils, and that health advisory committee that we've been referring parents to. So, um, yeah, so I feel like if we're going to have a discussion, it really, it should be at the full committee level, but we also should, you know, consider the input from those, those groups. Ms. Brusansky. Well, I think it, based on what, you know, Mr. Zahowski said, and I think I understand Mr. Kaufman's confusion in the, in the motion itself, is that we're not really talking just about the JFK a la carte options. We're really talking about the deficit in the food services department, right? And so that's why it would be or could be referred to budget and property subcommittee. So maybe there's just some wording in the motion itself. I also feel... Um, like it could be a good idea for us to just have a full committee discussion because I think the nature of the decision. I'm a little curious about what our, who makes up our school wellness committee and who our school wellness director is and how that whole piece works. The, the committee is under the direction of Karen Jarvis Vance. Um, the individual membership changes from time to time. I'm not exactly sure who's on it right now, but she is the convener. So she's the director? She's the school wellness director that she holds that title I'm going to call her the convener of the group I don't think it's a, okay. it's a it's additional title but it's the health advisory yeah, committee. The health advisory committee 
Yes. And roughly who's on it or how often do they meet or? They, they meet a, approximately, um, I want to say a quarterly basis. Okay. And, and the uh, of any, I mean, I'm not sorry, I don't mean to that's right. try yeah, to no. be, so but just roughly. If I think what I rather than you know guessing, yeah. I'd like to just have her send it out an email. Okay, or, that's great. And so, when you said that parents have been um, they've reached out so that parents can speak to them about it, what's the do you have any idea what the nature of the conversation is that this that the you know wellness advise the health advisory committee supports the a la carte items doesn't or they're just listening or any sense of it they have not held a meeting on this yet because of this meeting um so depending on where this conversation goes they um, are very willing to have a conversation at the start of school next year okay. so the next meeting is in september got it because it feels like that is a place that there that these kind of um, that this issue should go to as well. I guess I'm sort of agreeing with what Dr. Thomas <clears throat> was saying that it may not be policy rules and policy, but maybe it's the wellness advisory so, committee. But yeah, the health advisory council is comprised of uh, school and community members, and including school nursing staff, health and physical education staff, and the school physician. That Mr. Tramfaglia has also been an, an active member of the council. Um, according to the email I got from um, Karen Jarvis fans and that they had reached out to a couple parents um, on the PTO at the middle school to invite them at their next to their next meeting in September um, and that they are they meet quarterly during the school year to advise administration the superintendent and the school committee on issues surrounding the health and safety of the school committee um, and that anyone can be added to their email list so Okay. It does seem like it'd be important to try to, if at all possible, make this decision before this school year starts to continue, change, stop the a la carte items. Okay. Um, so there's a motion to refer that would still been made, and I think it's been seconded. Um, did you have a question? I, I would only say that another reason for the referral, in my opinion, would be to hear from the food service director in regards to um, the revenue that's being brought in through the a la carte. Um, I think another idea that's starting to get thrown around, and I heard the superintendent uh, mention this, I believe, that um, without doing more creative things to increase participation, one of the things that um, will need to eventually happen is, a, is an increase in the school lunch itself and with um, discussion around people having a hard time paying for AP and for athletic fees and other fees um, to now increase uh, the cost of what it, you know, to, to get a school lunch or to eat. I think it's something that I would want to try to avoid and so I would be listening to the food service director share that information so I mean again that could happen in a, in a full meeting or at subcommittee but that would be another piece that I'd be li li listening for yes do you already have um, a subcommittee meeting scheduled or is that something you would have to arrange like I'm just worried I'm, I'm I mean we already have a regular school committee meeting on the on the agenda for July you know on the calendar do you have a meeting already planned? We'll be chairing that one too. So. That oh yeah, that's the month you're gone. Well, it's just the, the right. <laughs> I'm teasing. Yeah, it's your conflict. Um, I'm just saying, if we wanted I, there, to make a decision I don't by there's September, anything planned yet. I will be speaking to the committee. clerk about scheduling a meeting soon. But we usually schedule within a couple weeks. It's usually not. Well, just, yeah, with the summer. I just meant, if, yeah. like you said, if this is something that you wanted to have mm -hmm. ironed out before September, it may be faster, in fact, mm -hmm. to put it on the full committee agenda. That's true. Because yeah. we already have that date blocked off. Okay. Once again, just trying to be practical. Um, I have a question. Is the, motion, is, is, is the motion was made to refer the JFK a la carte food sales to budget and property? That was the motion that was made. Yes. And now, have we, have, have we heard that fleshed out to say that what that really means is not micromanaging the question of whether or not that one thing is there is done, or is it still really just exactly what was moved? 
which my what, well, <laughs> what I heard is that's the that's the shorthand title on the you know on the it stands for the bigger questions. Apparently, yes. So yes. Can I amend the motion or? You sure could. So. I, I'm gonna, and then can I say something once it's sec if it's yeah, totally. okay. I'm gonna amend the motion to say, um, refer the food services um, budget deficit issues to the subcommittee for um, analysis of how we might do things differently. Is that capturing how or, or Mr. Moore, what you're? Yeah, and I only have a question about whether that's an adequate notice. In terms of the agenda, what? adequate notice on the agenda. Yeah, it's not really what we said we'd be voting on. I mean, it's, but I mean, it's part of it, so it's a little more specific. So. It's more general. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so your that's your motion to amend. And, and after, yeah, and I still have a question, but yeah, that's my motion. Yeah, to second amend. that. There's a second. Okay. So now there's a motion to amend that the, that the referral is not actually about the JFK a la carte. It's about the deficit of the school lunch program. Which includes the a la carte. Which does include a la carte sales at JFK. Um, okay, so all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay, so now it's amended. So now the amended motion is on the table. Um, any discussion of that? Or yes. Yeah. Sorry. So now, I, so with that amendment, um, I have two separate things. The first is I like the idea of sending it to a subcommittee. I think it's a chance where you can explore it more deeply, and um, it saves us time. We're talking about how to make these meetings take less time, and. You know, even though the AP discussion took a long time, there was a lot more done outside of this meeting that was brought here. And I feel really comfortable with the people on the subcommittee to report back what they learn and ask the right questions and to move it forward. So that's the first thing I want to say about that. And the second thing is a little bit different. I would like some advice from my colleagues here on how to go about talking to people. Um, I, I've heard from a lot of people that are upset that kids have access to food that I really would not necessarily um, think would belong readily accessible to an 11 or 12 year old. So I don't know where that discussion belongs. That's not the discussion we just referred to the subcommittee. It's a different discussion. But how are we going to move forward on that? And I really do think, you know, we when we talked about the AP issue, it became a much bigger issue and there's really important questions there. There's really important questions on this food too. Um, Kids are eating pretty junky cereals in the in the schools in the morning. Kids are eating a lot of sugar at lunch, and and it's our job to help them have the best school day possible. And I feel like it would be remiss to not point that out and just ask where can we try to improve that too. And you might get more kids buying lunch if it looked a little different, and that might help. So it is related. Can we can we call the food service director to the podium? <laughs> I know. I apologize, but I think it's good for the public to hear that it's not just all junk food that's being <laughs> sold. And I'd like you to speak to some of the nutritious food items that are available every day for students to consider. Now, I know there's a choice to be made, and kids making choices between, you know, chips and an apple. You know, that's a whole different discussion. But. Could you share with us what is happening currently? Yeah, absolutely. And for, at first, I want to touch on some of the foods that are actually being <coughs> talked about as the bad cereals and so on and so forth, whether I agree or not. But I will tell you, in our meetings with uh, the Department of Education, with our trainings, talking to different vendors, cereals that you have in the morning, you cannot buy them in the store. Oh, Krispies that we offer are made specifically for schools, They're designed that way. So this, the same ingredients are not, they're, they're modified for the calorie amounts, the portion sizes, the amount of cocoa, everything. Chips are the same way. Even the ice creams that go out to bid are the same way. All the products go out to bid as part of the purchasing group, and they're all bid on. So, you know, there's been conversation about, well, you know, should it be at certain age groups or not certain age groups? But the state of Massachusetts governs the regulations on a la carte items. The federal government regulates the food meal as a reimbursement piece. 
So there's two separate entities that go on. The state of Massachusetts is probably the toughest in the nation on the regulations that are in place. States that are right next door can actually sell a candy bar, Snickers bar. We don't do that. We won't do that. So all the items that we're looking at, whether I agree they're healthy or not, definitely meet the regulations by far and have to and have been approved by the state and obviously by these companies. But also the other items that we look at offering, the Nutrigrain bars, the you know, fresh fruit, the canned fruit, uh, vegetable sticks, you know, salads, there, there's a wide variety of what's there. So there are many, many options that people can choose from. Um, a lot of the school districts do this as a way in which to offset the financial burden that food service programs run into without having to go to an operating budget. And that's one of the big reasons why the state of Massachusetts allows these type of items, but monitor them very, very closely. Is it, is it, I just ask, is it, is it your experience that most, this is a, not a unique problem for Northampton? Correct. Yeah, most most schools <coughs> do offer these type of items. No, what I'm talking about is the budget problem. The, oh, budget problems, yeah. yes. Across the board, there are issues that every district may have. Some do better than others, and some actually will break even, and it all depends on what's happening <coughs> at that time or you know how their meals are, what their prices are. But I, we belong to, the city of Northampton belong to a purchasing group that I believe have 32 other districts that are part of it. So 32 districts around are all purchasing 90% of the food at the same pricing. So then you're looking at staffing and how it's being prepared and you know all, all types of different things that will offset budget. We'll talk about going in front of a subcommittee to talk and I can share all types of information there, but it's gonna be a lot of information there. A lot, just, just so people understand. So I wonder if you can just tell me if my general impression of this is correct. I know that approximately seven years ago the federal government the, the federal school lunch program changed its lunches significantly in order to make them healthier and I think that had a negative impact on um, many school budgets because kids no longer wanted to participate is that Correct. accurate on the participation and at the same time the state of Massachusetts regulations came into play too on competitive foods so when that first started over, I can tell you this is my third school district that I've worked in. What I saw over the other districts, and even looking back a little bit here in years past on the information that I could see, participation was higher before the regulations were in place. And so now all these new regulations are placed are a lot tougher. It's slowly creeping up, but not by much. Um, you know, where we're at, you know, we fluctuate up a little bit. On how the students are moving through the schools and what they're really enjoying, um, but yeah, it did have that a major impact upon that. So, I, again, the, the yellow car piece, and I know it's a hot topic, and, and I'm only trying to manage the program. You know, my, my own personal beliefs. I promise are not involved. There's, there was no malicious intent. It was, it was definitely a positive <coughs> intent to try to get the program to actually work as a standalone without accepting money from the operating budget type program so that we can all go forward from there. Um, I didn't realize what it was going to create, but it was a positive thinking type piece. Um, there are a lot, there can be some options to talk about and some things to discuss, but you know, it's really limited to quite a bit of regulation and that's where it gets a little tricky. How many leaves can you shake out of a tree before you say, okay, here's all that we have. We can raise school lunch prices more, maintain a la carte, um, try to increase participation, and go from those type of points in order to bring more revenue in. Ms. Walczak, did you have a Yeah, on the, just a, a reference to the financial piece quickly. Um, this year, the subsidy actually is being increased from forty to fifty-six thousand dollars, and next year it's forty-eight thousand dollars. The reason for the increase this year and next year are because of something that you might not relate to the lunch program, but many of our schools extended the lunch period this year, which is 
what many people feel is a benefit to kids. They needed more times to eat, more time for recess. That had a financial impact on the program. So we had to come up with $16,000, which was the price of the additional 10 to 15 minutes a day for all the cafeteria staff in the three or four schools that were impacted. So there were drivers to this budget that aren't necessarily talked about that play into this. And you know we're hoping this year we footed that $16,000 bill. The plan in next year's budget is the school budget will fund half of it, and the food service program will hopefully fund half of it. If that doesn't work, we'll end up footing the whole bill for that also. So there's always these outside factors that you don't necessarily think about when you're thinking about the lunch program that can be very expensive. And we had a new contract that gave additional holidays to the staff. That is great. They've got holidays now equal to other support staff. That had a price tag that we never had to carry in that program before. Mr. Sasky? Um, with extended lunchtime pieces, really interesting. I, and thanks for the information that you shared with us. And I know that you know you've taken a couple steps in this direction since you've been here, and we won't have you much longer. But um, which I think is great. But I do think that there are a lot of districts around the just within the Pioneer Valley alone, but across Massachusetts that are doing incredible work on farm to school. Actually, Chicopee yeah. just won the farm to school award this year for what they're doing and local food, et cetera. And I know you had just started taking a couple steps in that direction, but I do really believe that we can be doing a lot better and that what we really are seeing across the state is that kids really will eat better food if you give it to them in ways they like it, if you're taste, what you mentioned, if you're taste testing it with them, if you're, there's lots of different ways you can get at that. And I think that's an important, when we look at participation, I think that's a really important aspect of this. What are we serving to them? And we're talking about Chicopee, Springfield, Amherst, I mean, you know, Ms. Burnham said early that we take some cues from Amherst, like the Amherst Food Service Director I know is doing phenomenal things. So I think, and it's in Greenfield, I mean, I think it's all around us and it's a movement and we need to be a bigger part of that movement moving forward. And again, you had sort of taken a step towards that and so we won't have you to continue in that vein, that's first of all. But, you know, I think this kind of nutrition piece of it's really important and it's interesting what Massachusetts has stated are the standards or the federal standards, but you know, Northampton as a community, twice we have said that the minimum educational funding that Massachusetts lays out is not enough for our students. And we've passed two overrides because of that. And I think that goes to the point about what we're serving them and what this, what's being sold in this a la carte. That, that is a low bar to me, what the Massachusetts standards are. That 51% of the ice cream cone is whole grain so that that processed food company could actually sell to our students. And we're adding a lot of calories to their diets. I'm not saying that nobody brings junk food or brings you know, potato chips or cookies in, but now we're selling it to them on top of it. And kids are missing recess. I mean, it's ironic that you say that we've extended lunchtime to give them extra recess. Well, they're missing it because either there's a line or they have to eat their food inside. And so I'm having kids tell me that they're not able to go out for recess if they choose to buy this food. And we want them to buy this food because we need to make up the deficit. So I understand it's a very complicated issue that we need to sort out, but I think there's a budgetary piece to it. And then I think there's a whole wellness piece to it of what we're really, what are the, as we were talking about earlier, what are the unintended consequences of this decision? And, um, and what do we want to you know, do about that and where that goes? Okay. Question. So, but we have a, we just motion have, we have a motion to refer <coughs> first. So that you, you amended the motion to refer, so we kind of forgot on that, and then I'm not sure what the, then there's the other secondary question, which I don't really know whether whether that goes to the wellness committee to look at, uh, you know, I don't, to make a recommendation about nutrition in the schools, which is part of their purview under our policy, I don't know. But can we at first dispense with the motion? Can, can I add to it? Because we can't have two motions going at the same time, but go ahead. I, I think this actually could relate to the motion to the budget as I'm sitting here. Um, I, thank you. This was very helpful to hear um, all of this. You know, as, as we're looking out for the health of these kids and trying to get kids that are on free and reduced lunch into the AP classes, I would argue that feeding them well from starting in kindergarten or whenever they start in our schools, younger, um, has a big effect on their day. And we all know that. And um, this may be a place where we need to look at the budget and say, should we be finding money to cover the people watching the kids at lunchtime so that the lunches don't cost quite as much and we can increase the quality? I don't know where that conversation happens, but I personally, as a Northampton citizen, would be very supportive of that 
line of thinking do we need to spend more money to feed the kids well so that they can have the best learning experience they can for the six hours and it affects the entire class it affects everybody in that class if, if kids are not um, having problems from high sugar and not and maybe not eating it because they didn't like it whatever so I would I would like to explore that somehow I don't know where it belongs and I understand it will cost more money I would way rather pay for that than AP tests out of our budget. That's and that would affect some kids. Do you know what the participation rate is for the district as far as how many people, students participate in the lunch program? Yeah, it's about, um, it, it, I mean, it varies from high school on sure. to the elementaries, but I, I'm going to say that it's right around 48%. 48%. So half of the kids would benefit from it. I think, can well, you tell I mean, us the demographics of that half? It, how many of them are on free and reduced lunch? Actually, I'll, I think maybe a better statistic to share would to say that free and reduced kids, if we take the 100%, only about 70% of them are actually still purchasing lunch, even though they can get it for free or reduced. So, you know, you have 100 kids that are eligible for free lunch, maybe 70 will buy lunch in the course of a day. 30 of them are either bringing lunch from home or doing something else. Okay. So, it, in Really, honestly, I can break down those numbers really quick. Our point of sale system allows us to do that. So, and, and I think that's, it, it's a huge conversation of a lot of different working components in order to come up with plans. Um, I, I'm thrilled that you want, every, that everyone wants to go and get better food. As a food service person, you see the food I love to cook. I love to serve great food. Um, and I would continue to do that, and I'm sh sure any director would love to do that. But it all comes down to what's placed in front of them for the financial piece of it. You know, they, here's regulations, here's guidelines. I can't even de design a menu without making sure that certain colors of vegetables are offered throughout the course of a week. And I think a lot of times not everybody understands just to put a menu together the difficulties to make sure that it just meets the, reg the simple regulations. <laughs> And then everything else that ties along with it, and that's to make sure that they, the students would consume it, and you really can't get around it too much anymore, which is a good thing. You know, no, you can't cheat the system. We are audited, we're regulated. We, you know, people are always looking at what we're doing, and that's a great thing. But the difficulty becomes in where's the money coming? I, I don't. I'd love to be doing steak and lobster every day. You know, or saute stations or fresh chicken. Mm -hmm. um, but how, how do you make that work for all students? I would think. I'd also say that, you know, years ago, we, you know, we were part of Farm to School. We had a program called Fresh Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. we've, we've gone down this route before, and I think the pullback has been financial. Um, we noted that when we were getting local produce, um, because of the amount of processing that needed to be done in order to um, get it from its crude form to uh, to table, it was requiring more labor hours. Um, the, although it was locally grown, that was exciting. You know, getting certain things from local orchards, it was it was driving up the the cost of. Uh, the experience. So I, I hear you. Um, if this is a conversation that the school committee wants to have in regards to using local and um, increasing the amount of um, work needed in order to prepare, prepare it to bring it to table, um, you know, that's not, you know, not that's something that we can discuss. But um, it's going to come at the cost of programming and something else. And. So I think we just need to be cautious of that, and I believe that the USDA guidelines are there for a reason to kind of protect children to a certain extent, to not go overboard on some of these um, uh, these things that are concerning to us, like childhood obesity and others. And uh, sticking to those guidelines can be at least a baseline from which we can work. I think we've come a long way since Fresh Wednesday and how school systems are able to procure uh, fresh local vegetables in terms of being fully prepared, et cetera, before they come to our schools. So I wouldn't really use that as your. I'm glad you. I'm glad person. you have that information. I don't have that information. I know. That's I think why I'm we could. I think we could speak to Mr. Tranfaglia. He may be able to share that with us. Sure. Yeah, it, it is getting. You know, the problems that we look at is. You know, do we pick a school to work with what we can get for local produce? 
uh, to do it as a district, the, the volume that we go through is massive. So most places, it's really unavailable. It becomes an unavailable for the entire district on one meal. So you can look at different things. The other, the, again, the discussion we if we, could, if we could do this all night. A, another piece of the discussion is okay. So let's say we wanted to do a fresh salad bar of all local stuff across the board, and you know, in the course of a school year, it might cost thirty thousand dollars. In order to count it as a vegetable that we could then count it as part of the reimbursable meal, it has to be a certain portion size amount. If the student chooses, well, I just want a little bit of lettuce, or I just want a little bit of the local vegetable, whatever it might be, it's a giveaway. Another vegetable has to go on that tray to make it a reimbursable meal. And so we see that a lot, where everything that we do is portioned out the amount that goes on a tray, a salad, we prepare the salad in those plastic containers on purpose because it has to be a certain amount of lettuce in there. If it's not, we can't count that as a green vegetable. So then there's, it doesn't count as part of a component within a reimbursable meal. So you see where I'm kind of going with this, where there's, there's definitely ways and people are doing it and making it work. And I, I would suggest that we continue to keep talking to everybody to see how they make it work but again there's it's always the financial piece of where we're gonna look to move to be able to pull the stuff off I promise you I'd love to I said drive by that farm stand down there and my car always wants to pull in there get some asparagus or vegetables or whatever I mean what you see there today I was over at Atkin farm having a blast picking out those local strawberries because it's local stuff it's what we want to do Food service directors are not opposed to anything that's going on, but it's the ability to be able to make the program work. Okay, so um, there's still the motion to refer the issue to budget and property uh, that got amended. Um, so can we take a vote on that? So the motion was amended to say that we would be referring the issue of the budget deficit of the food service program to budget property so all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. opposed no okay i believe it carries but from what i could hear so i think the motion carries so that issue's been referred to budget and property um and then the other question then you asked about is the whole issue of just um overall sort of nutritiousness of lunches or the whole nutrition issue and so I guess I feel like they've heard that and I'm trust them to include good. that in their discussion if fine. other people is that do other okay unless okay that's fine I'm I okay to sure. I just wanted that to be part of it okay all right thank you Mr. Trampaglia in so many ways thank you for the lovely uh, spread tonight that you put together for the retirees thank you okay thank you Okay, so um, that we can now move on to a third reading and a vote on policy JQ, which is student fees, fines, and charges revised. And I'll turn to Ms. Fallon. Yes, I'm moving the third time for charge. Mm -hmm. um, we can keep doing we, this. <laughs> yes, we're, we're happy to keep doing this. Um, so we had um, at the last meeting, um, we realized that the wording of the first paragraph of this amended policy was problematic and we um, we have rewritten that um, uh, to read for policy JQ student fees and fines while it is a responsibility of the school committee to ensure that the children of the school district are provided with free public education the school committee recognizes the need for student fees to fund certain school activities therefore no fee or charges may be required as a condition of school year attendance other than a required course or for materials or activities that are part of the course requirement. The schools may charge students enrolled in certain courses a fee for the cost of materials used in projects that will become the property of the student, charge a fine for lost and damaged books, materials, supplies, equipment, and property. All other fees require school committee approval. Um, and that students who are eligible for the free lunch program are exempt from paying fees. Students who are eligible for the reduced lunch program will pay a reduced fee. However, no student will be exempt from being fined for lost and damaged books, locks, materials, supplies, equipment, and property. 
Um, we also added the paragraph that student fees will be listed and described annually in each school student handbook or in other, some other written form and distributed to each student. The notice will advise students that fees are to be paid prior to participation. Um, so the, it was the first paragraph that we had found problematic, and I don't know what the feedback is um, from the full committee as to whether or not the revision addressed your concerns. But I would move to accept um, to revise policy JQ as amended. I'll second that. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to revise policy <coughs> JQ. Is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstention? Okay, so third reading is a charm. I was really hoping to do this for another couple of months. <laughs> okay, so the next item on the agenda is a discussion, um, and this is of a school committee retreat. Um, I think we, our, our goal has been to try to have a certain number of these, um, and I know we had one last year at the high school, and so the thought was to try to have a similar retreat. Um, <coughs> about five or six years ago, we brought in, uh, I think it was Ginny Tate, to talk, to have a sort of discussion with us about some of the questions that come up about the role roles of the school committee, the interplay between the school committee and the administration, et cetera. Um, so that was something that we were thinking, uh, that I'm thinking about would be good to do again because we've had such a big change in membership. So the thought was to do that um, and do it sort of now during our more quiet period that the, that the um, budget's completed and we're, you know, moving into the summer period. Um, and so my question was if we were to have Miss, uh, uh, you know, have our uh, have do a doodle poll sent out basically to see what days people are available. Um, is that something people would be amenable to? Okay. Um, I don't remember if how many people were even here from when she came and did that. Okay. It was when Regina. Was it, was it Regina? Yeah. Nash. It was when the interim superintendent yeah. Nash was yeah. here. Tate. Yeah, it was very useful. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, um, but again, it's, it's been a while now. So, um, so is, and we're thinking July, August, sometime like that. So we could just, we could do a doodle poll and see what times are available. We'd have to check with Attorney Tate as well. So, okay. So we'll try to work on that and send you a doodle poll and see if we can find a time that, that works. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is just I just had one question. I'm sorry. Sure. So in addition to um, to the meeting, would be be looking for topics to discuss or would that be set from from uh, June eight? Um, so I, I think we we had the we had the, we had the director from MAC came. We had a meeting at um, mm -hmm. the fire station. The fire remember that station. night? And uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, Glenn Kucher, I think, led it. Um, and we solicited ideas and topics that we thought would be helpful for discussion. And then we kind of picked the ones that we wanted to address. I just didn't know what the format was. That's all. Yeah. That's um, what we did at the last retreat. We just did. Mm -hmm. We did awesome. last retreat. Yeah. So we can try to do that again. We can we can poll people on things that they and that would at least give her something to direct and to guide her conversation. Um, I mean, she sort of does, a, she has a unique perspective because she was an attorney throughout pre, you know, ed reform, through ed reform, right up to the current time. She just retired last year. So she sort of gives a, that history and then gives a, you know, an overview and then, but then can certainly talk about specific issues. So we can certainly try to pull people on those as well. I think it might just be helpful if it was brought up during the evening that she if she did do any preparation yeah. for it. Okay. Yes. Just a thought. This may be Im implied in your suggestion, but um, I think with this particular presenter, it would be really helpful to focus on questions that might have a legal nature. <laughs> it, it's it's really a unique opportunity to get someone who has a vast treasure of experience on legal questions involving schools and school committees and so if those types of things are on your mind okay so we'll try to send that out as well okay. 
So the next item on the agenda is the third reading <coughs> and the request to name the basketball court at Ryan Road as Legends Court. Um, Mr. Coffin, did you want to say anything about this in third reading? <clears throat> Just that uh, we received <clears throat> presentation from Michael O'Brien, the president of League of Legends, to name the new basketball court that's now completed at Ryan Road to be named Legends Court in honor of uh, League of Legends David Holman and Miles Adams. Uh, for whom the court was built. So, unless you want to open up the questions, I think we've satisfied that third reading. I think that satisfies it. Yeah. Um, so next we'll move on to our the gifts that we have this evening on the agenda. We have a gift of the JFK PTO, um, and it's $5,000 for the Grade 6 Science Museum field trip. Ms. Walzik, did you want to? That's pretty much it. It allowed okay. Allow the three sixth grade classes to go to the science museum. Make a motion to accept the gift JFK PTO five thousand dollars for grade six science museum field trips. Second. Um, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, next gift is the uh, Daniel St. John art paper district. Anything to add? Uh, yes, Mr. St. John is an artist in Amherst, and he was cleaning out some storage space and very generously offered to donate an assortment of um, construction paper to our art programs. Motion to accept the gift from Daniel St. John, uh, art paper, to the district art program. Second. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that gift is accepted. Next is the Mass Bioed Foundation donating lab equipment to NHS. Yes, this grant includes an extensive list of equipment as well as some professional development for the teachers at the high school to be able to offer these classes to the students. Motion to accept the gift from Mass Bioed Foundation of lab equipment to Northampton High School. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, any abstentions? Okay. Next is a gift of assorted uh, computers and com printers from Smith College and projectors. Yes, Smith College tends, uh, continues to be very generous with donating equipment to us that they no longer need, so the, the summary lists what's there. This would also be going to the City Council for approval since it's a material gift in excess of $10,000. Motion to accept the gift from Smith College. I'm going to read these. 30 Dell desktop computers, 10 MacBook Pro laptops, 30 iMacs, 15 laser jet printers, <clears throat> 5 projectors to the district. Second. All those in favor of accepting this gift, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any <clears throat> abstentions? Okay. Uh, next is a vote to surplus some Bridge Street Library books. Yes, as part of the beginning of the library renovation project, Bridge hopes to undertake soon. Um, they started weeding out library books, and they've got a number of books. They put a value on it of approximately $500 that they would like us to de declare a surplus, and their intent would be to donate these to programs that can use the books and distribute them to students. Motion to surplus Bridge Street School Library books. Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor of that surplus, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next, we have a vote. Um, this is to grant the Superintendent Budget Transfer Authority to close out the FY 2018 budget. This is an annual request that we make um, to allow the superintendent to do this. Um, did you want to? Explain, do, do you anticipate? Uh, yeah, maybe for the new members. So as we go into the last couple of weeks of the year, there may be some more budget transfers needed to clean up some of our accounts. We don't physically transfer every dollar to make every account come out to zero, but there may be some budget areas where we want we do want to do that. Um, so this gives us the authority to go ahead and do those as part of our closeout process during the next few weeks. Make a motion to grant the superintendent budget transfer authority to close out the FY18 books. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, Ms. Walczak, the Business Administrator Report. Yep, you've got the probably next to the last FY18 budget report included in here. Um, overall, I think we're going to be able to close out the year okay and cover. There are still a few deficits showing in some areas. We're going to be able to cover those balances in other accounts. I think overall the year is going to close out okay. 
moving on, there are a list of summer facility projects. We give you a brief summary of some of the bigger ones that would be happening. The ones that are listed here are actually all funded through the city's capital program. And there's going to be a lot of stuff going on in the schools this year. And what's not listed here is extensive um, technology improvements going on, too, with our infrastructure. Um, mention in here that we did authorize our attorney to send out letters to seven families that had food service debt in excess of $500. Um, I have actually received contact from two families of those seven as of today to work on payment plans, um, and we'll give them some period of time to catch up with that debt. Our overall program is still struggling with the amount of debt, and we're hoping that during the next two to three weeks before we close out the year and we have to cover the debt, that we can make a last-minute attempt to get more of this debt collected. Um, you have a extensive list, list of gifts here that have been accepted over the past month as we go into primarily field trip time of the year. Um, the superintendent accepted a gift on behalf of Northampton High School from the East Hampton Knights of Columbus for $500 towards the robotics program. Grow Food Northampton actually made seven donations to three of our elementary schools that totaled $1,875 for trips to the field trips to the community gardens. Uh, and Bridge Street accepted a gift from the Sojourner Truth Committee to allow for a bus to go and do a field trip related to the, um, the history of Northampton, and that had a value of about $300. And then gifts accepted from the PTO. Um, Bridge Street School had three donations for supplies and coding kits that totaled $1,289. Bridge Street also had two field trips funded by the PTO for $550. JFK had various supplies and stipends for teachers funded in the amount of $450. Jackson Street School had 11 trips funded by their PTO at a value, a cost of $4,528. So the PTO gifts this month alone that we're presenting you um, total almost $7,000. And then last in your pile are the two warrants that have been signed since your last meeting by your school committee delegate. Okay, thank you very much. Personnel report? Very short at this time of year. One hiring, as you see listed, um, three separations, and one transfer between school buildings. Okay. Um, next we have a vote, and it's a vote to authorize the superintendent to carry over some vacation days. Um, into FY 2019. Would you like to explain the request? Uh, <laughs> I've been doing better. <laughs> I, promise, but I, I still have um, I still have more than more than ten days. I'm not going to be able to take them by the end of the month. So my contract allows me to take carry over up to ten. I'd like to carry over those ten, please, in the hope that I might do even better next year. <laughs> I feel like this should be the last year you can start taking care of yourself. Yeah. Plan a trip, take a day off, sit in your pajamas. We don't care. You have July and August to, to use those 10 days, right? I'm going to try. Okay. So do you think you'd be more motivated to use your vacation days if we stopped carrying these things over? No, not really. Okay. I mean, I shouldn't be here tonight, really. I mean, I think that some other members may have the same cold I have, but, no. but what can you do? <laughs> Make a motion to authorize superintendent to carry over vacation days to FY19. Ten days. Ten what did I? Oh, ten. did I? Oh, just ten. Just what, it's oh, not on the agenda. Gotcha. You wanted to be specific. Ten. Second. Okay. okay so there's been a motion <laughs> and seconded to authorize that. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So now we'll move to the superintendent's report. Thank you. In my report, we'll return to the topic that was the sole um, public comment tonight. As a parent at last night's forum on the JFK incident put it, I feel that the bubble that we live in has been burst. And I think that sums up the way many of us feel. And I include not only the JFK learning community in that, but the entire district, because every school is touched by this event. I think that there are many bubble bursting moments in the life of an individual or a community. We have a sense of our uniqueness that makes us feel protected from things that happen to other people or in other places. And then something happens that shows us that we're not so special and that there's no problem out there that isn't also in here. 
I've, a, I've been asked what can be learned from all of this. In fact, the administrators have a formal process of asking just that question as part of their after action review. From my perspective, the lesson to be learned whenever a bubble bursts is the same. As I said, there's no problem out there that doesn't ex also exist in here. So we have this paradox. The Northampton Public Schools are so special. Each school has a unique identity and they all come together to create a truly exceptional district. But in our challenges, we are just like everybody else. We struggle with our biases, just like everybody else. We struggle with conflict, just like everybody else. We struggle with trust, just like everybody else. In a word, we're human. Within this tension between our uniqueness and our sameness lies the opportunity for learning. And it's a lot more tolerable to burst our own bubbles than to have someone burst them for us. So going back to our core values, I have to ask, do we live in a bubble of engagement or are there some students or even whole groups of students who are disconnected from the life of the school and the community? Do we live in a bubble where all students are reaching their potentials or are there barriers preventing some students or even whole groups of students from accessing our highest level classes? Do we live in a bubble of kindness, empathy, and tolerance? Or are there some students and even whole groups of students who are treated less than charitably in our schools? We need to keep taking stock of how we support each other when times are difficult and when they are not so difficult. So now I'll close by talking about some other bubbles. And they're not the kind that you need to worry about popping. I'm talking about the soap bubbles wafting in their masses over our athletic complex during our first unified Special Olympics. That's where you will find students flourishing in the space between our uniqueness and our sameness. Kids who are so dissimilar in every observable aspect of their lives, yet same in their identity as Northampton students and as young people. That's the spirit that can heal divisions. That's the spirit that can keep us all safer. That's the spirit that we must nurture, if for no other reason than for our own enlightened self-interest. As our friends in the disability community remind us, so-called able-bodiedness is also a bubble that sooner or later will burst for all of us. And when it is our turn to experience either a long or a short period of disability, we will want people like those game changers who partnered with our students with disabilities to be there for us. And that's my report. Excellent. So we have no new business on tonight's agenda. Um, future business and meeting dates, we have the superintendent evaluation team meeting on June 20th at 3 p.m. in the superintendent's office. The rules and policy subcommittee meeting June 21st at 3 p.m. in the superintendent's office. And then our regular school committee again meeting again on July 10th, 2018 at 7.15 p.m. here in the JFK community room. Um, we do not need the executive session, thank goodness, that was posted on the agenda tonight. So I would do now, adjourn. Uh, is there a second? Yep. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Any abstention? The school committee meeting has adjourned.